off. Oh my word! Perfeita. Four in a row for Team Queso. CRL West enters its third week with two teams still undefeated, but the defending Western champions Space Station Gaming enter their double match weekend at full strength with the return of their 2v2 duo in full force. It's going to be a good one. Hello and welcome. I'm Rich Slayton. Joining me as always, my friend Andrew Guy to talk you through all the action here in the Clash Royale League Western region. And as mentioned before, two teams expected to perform at the highest level. Tribe Gaming and SK still undefeated at this stage. But surging up behind them, a chance to really make up some ground is Space Station Gaming. Andrew, it looks to be another great weekend here in CR. Yeah, what an interesting Saturday it's going to be today. Hi, everybody. Very excited to be here. We got five teams going into matches today that are one and one. Chiva's still looking to get their first win, but we'll talk about that in just a second. But we're going to figure out who's part of the elite today and who's going to hang out right there in the middle of the pack at the end of the day. First off, you guys joining us on YouTube, maybe on Twitch, make sure you're following us on Twitch. Subscribe on YouTube and notifications are turned on for both. It's the best way to watch what we do every single weekend, Saturday morning, 10 a.m., Sunday morning, 10 a.m. And of course, you can go and vote on the matches and keep up with all of the CRL news, CR news in general. If you follow us on Twitter, at Esports Royale, E-N, you can follow Rich at Rich Slayton. He's giving a giveaway today. And of course, you can follow me at Andrew Guy. A lot of good content coming up there. Lastly, Fantasy Royale. Oh my gosh, what a year it has been for me. I love that I get to cover this segment every single week, and I know you love that I get to talk about it. 31 crowns, baby. 250 gold, 100 gems. I am so freaking close to first place. I'm tied with like, like 50 people or 30 people. It's insane, dude. I'm so stoked. Well, I'm going to catch up to you this weekend because uh, I picked the dynamic duo to be in my... I'll say it right now. I put AC and RF in my lineup. They go twice. We'll talk about them, of course, all throughout the weekend. But, Andrew, of course, we have another big news, our segment Break Time yeah. Battles. Uh, we have our first bit of uh, of top tier top tier performers. Yeah, it's crazy. So Break Time Battles, you can go to StatsRoyale.com. Very, very easy to find. It's right there at the top of the page. But basically what it is, is you're going to have a Break Time Battle with a CRL Pro if you're the number one person out there so a big time congratulations we'll get there in just one second top five you're gonna get some swag top 50 you'll be on the leaderboard so break time battle is an awesome thing that you guys can go check out on statsroyale.com and there is our winner john pulling for team liquid he'll be facing off against a pro we also got fatmir thanos himself ice spirit evan and lipo visic lipo vasic hope i got those right you guys will all be receiving some swag from us over a supercell but also john good luck to you in your battle against the crl pro we'll be announcing that tomorrow i believe and these are our top 50 rich i know one cool thing for you and i was that we saw a lot of names that we recognize in the community friends of ours and i mean there's a great example right there full frontage himself yeah, a whole lot of people who are very active overall in the Clash Royale community. If you've played any of the tournaments that I've hosted or any of the tournaments that, uh, that are open for a lot of players, I can see a lot of you guys there who are uh, who are very active as competitive players. So congratulations. Uh, getting your little shout-out here on CRL. And uh, keep on going, man. Break Time Battles <laughs> is a pretty cool segment. But, Andrew, we have a few news items to hit up. Yeah. First and foremost, brand-new card released, announced the Electro Giant. And I think it's going to shred through uh, some of your favorite bait cards. Yeah, it's crazy, man. The attack or stun speed on those little zappers on the back of the Electro Giant are fascinating. However, it's a very, very expensive card. I saw some pros talking about it already today on Twitter. So we'll see. Eight Elixir, beefy tank, decent movement speed, does a lot of damage pretty quickly. Sounds pretty horrible for me and bait and mortar, but I guess we'll have to see moving forward. Other big news pieces, Rich, is we had our very first CRL East team lock for World Finals, which is a team that you told me a lot about last week, and I don't think either of us are surprised to see them in this position. 
No, I mean, the, the roster overall for Ponos is absolutely nasty. Yeah. I mean, it might be, it is one of those, one of the best rosters in the world, hands down. And uh, they're performing to the level of unexpected. So congrats to Ponos. We'll be seeing you in Shanghai, China, and we'll see who, which four teams come from the West. And speaking of those four teams come from the West, Andrew, last bit of news item here, mentioned top of the show, the return of Ah Crap to the Space Station yeah. gaming lineup. He'll be appearing twice this weekend. And I have to expect that he and RF will be back together in 2v2. Yeah, you know, they've been spending a lot of time together in person. I know that they are staying in the same location, so I'm sure they've been practicing. Very excited to see them come out in our second match of the day against Chivas Esports, who is still looking to pick up their very first win. Team Queso and CRB going to kick things off for us, both one and one. And of course, Dignitas and Team Liquid to close things out. Rich, talk to me about tomorrow in that big time middle of the day matchup. Yeah, well, tomorrow, first and foremost, we have Cream Royale, Betis, and Payne. So Cream doing their double duty. And then in the middle, we will only have one undefeated team after this weekend. SK Gaming and Tribe going face-to-face. -face. Loser gets the gets the L, and the winner will be 4-0 and on the season and a good shot to make their run towards World Finals. And then finally, Space Station Gaming comes back out a second time against a Misfits squad that is still looking for a win here in CRL West. All right, so our predictions for the day, you, Koji, and Manu, essentially perfect, tied through three weeks at 11-1. and one. Looks like all of us basically in agreement there at the top, except for you saying that Team Queso is going to take it. Deco and Bruno a little bit farther behind, and Twitter actually, I guess, in third place, if you will, if you guys are all technically tied. I like where we're at, all of us pulling for Space Station, and it's kind of a coin toss for the other two matchups. I'm a little surprised there. What do you think it is about that? Well, you know, it's it seems crazy to, to look at Team Liquid Dig as a toss-up match, but the performance of Team Liquid so far this season hasn't given people a ton of confidence. So Dignitas, with some good performances here, especially with Cody Go and King of the Hill, it's making a bit of a, a, a back and forth vote. I'm pulling for, I'm not, I'm voting on Team Liquid. I think they're going to take the day, mm -hmm. but it's a close one. And then in that first one, Team Queso versus Cream, it feels like Queso has the advantage in King of the Hill, maybe in 1v1, Cream the advantage in 2v2. Yeah. This one feels like one of the closest matchups of the entire weekend. Yeah, and you know, and they're both coming off a loss, so you know that they're super hungry. Obviously, I believe it was Cream that lost to Dig, and then Queso losing to SK, so wanting to bounce back in their first matchup here of the day, and a big matchup it's going to be for exactly the reasons you're talking about. Let's take a look at our first match of the day. Oh, that it's going to be 30. I'm sorry. I thought he said it's three. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to it's going to be a pretty good one. And then we, when we go into our middle match of the day, Space Station Gaming, uh, I'm pretty pumped out, pumped for this one. It seems like everyone across the board is picking Space Station and it's hard not to. Let's go ahead now and jump into a little video about our first match. Magic today. Archer oh. cannot put it quite in range. Defensive freeze. And here you go. Queso versus Cream, it's going to be all about being able to take down Ruben for CRB. And come back with a massive counter push, and you just spent five elixir. The problem is, is that now Graveyard plus Snowball has become so devastating. Slows bueno, ¿qué le puedo decir acá? Se enfrentan dos de mis equipos favoritos y para mí que Cream va a venir con todo. El ganador del 2 contra 2 se llevaría esta gran partida. Acabó. A torre ya va caído. 1 a 0 para Ruben, Deco. So important for every one of these balloon pushes. And Ewis goes to the right hand side. Oh, Looks like wow. maybe it's an attempt at a steal here. No va a ser last weekend was stacked with close calls and both of these teams saw their fair share between Ruben versus Javi, and you saw right there the duo for Cream Royale Betis coming out very, very close against Indatos. Well, today, those two teams hoping for a little bit less of a close call. Andrew, 
Team Queso in the blue corner. Coming out with Benny Hu, Kuchiku, most likely going to be their 2v2 duo. I am JP and Ruben, their 1v1 stars. Ruben has been playing exceptionally well. Kuchi and Benny, 1-1 one and one on the season in that 2v2 set. Let's see if they can take that into the positive column as they face off against CRB today. Where in red, Cream Real Betis. They have had an exceptional 2v2 showing so far coming into match three. Belican, Diego E, X Pedro 15, and Michifu. And I'm specifically talking about Diego E and Michi, who have been playing very, very well in that opening set for Cream. Taking down Razor, Canario, Flash, and Cody Go. But it's going to be about closing things out today for CRB. Yeah, this is a big 2v2 and maybe more of a referendum on uh, Benny and Coochie as far as their 2v2. This is a duo that so far is performing well, but still feels like it's not quite an elite duo yet out of Cream Real Betis. So if Coochie and Benny can get a win here, that's huge to give IMJP and Ruben a nice setup as we go into King of the Hill. So Benny Hu and Coochie Q banning Tornado. Michifu and Diego E taking Musketeer out of play. A lot of rumblings about the nerfs that are coming to Musketeer. We'll have those for you hopefully coming sometime soon. But as for now, she will not be featured in this 2v2 set. Back to what you were saying at the beginning of the match, Rich. I do believe that Michi and Diego do have a very, very slight edge over Benny and Kuchi. Let's see if that's true here in game number one. Let's go ahead and jump on in, Team Queso. At the bottom of your screen, Diego E and Michifu up at the top. Minor in, bats behind. And so far, again, Benny Hu and Kuchi Ku completely even on the season at three wins and three losses. And it's been a four and one season thus far for Michi and Diego E. Yeah, the, the fact that those two guys have been able to work so well in that 2v2 set really provides a lot of confidence and support here for CRB moving forward. So double giant skeleton on the Cream Royale Betis side and looking like it's going to be quad bait most likely for Team Queso. Yeah, bait with Miner, something that's been really, really strong in 2v2. The one thing that you got to worry about is how are you going to be able to keep up as Elixir starts to flow like crazy and double and tricks triple. And the rarely seen Royal Delivery, which despite losing the knockback, still feels like it has some good utility in different moments. We'll see how effective it is for them in this case. One spell I don't think we'll see, Andrew, in this situation is going to be the Lightning because of that Musketeer ban. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one thing that doesn't make it quite as threatening. You could substitute in now instead maybe something a little bit cheaper like a Fireball because we know that Magic Archer likes to be paired with Giant Skeleton. However, Lightning was really, really dominant last week. Assuming that Michi and Diego won't have it though, like you said. So controlling the Giant Skeleton high right now is Team Queso pitching a shutout are the cheesy ones first the t through the first two minutes and it's Wall Breakers. Interesting to see Wall Breakers in 2v2. It feels like with the number of troops in 2v2 over wall, that the wall breakers are just gonna get into clogged lanes repeatedly. Yeah, it's gonna happen a lot. I mean, that's the second set of wall breakers we saw come out. It's not a lot of success, but again, single elixir is when this deck is gonna succeed against Michi and Diego E. Now it's gonna be all about the defense. Do they have enough in this quick cycle deck to defend against a balloon and a graveyard? And, and a freeze. there's a freeze in. Yeah, that's a pretty big freeze. E was trying to hold on. That balloon not going to get a shot, but death damage will come in as we approach the final 30 seconds. And that is a lot of log value there. Snowball has to come out behind, but Team Queso extending their lead as we get closer to sudden death. Yeah, Benny and Coochie doing a really great job of putting up just enough pressure, supporting that right-hand side, offsetting their defensive units to the right so that they work towards that weaker tower. And also they slip in those wall breakers on the left-hand side just to add a little bit more pressure and create that dual lane threat. Here we go, final few seconds of regulation time on into sudden death and the right hand tower of Cream Royale Betis in a lot of trouble. Gonna be under a thousand HP now with that minor connection, but can Team Kesa hold on against this balloon freeze push? We'll see, I mean, they did a pretty good job the first time. That e has actually been a really, really great decision in the deck for Benny and Kuchi. I'm sure it was no mistake, but that stun is really frustrating for a balloon to get through the tower. Well, one of the interesting things about this matchup here, Andrew, is that because they are splitting between the graveyard and the balloon, it makes defending the graveyard a whole lot easier for Team Queso because 
their one poison can just sit on that one graveyard. Yeah, that's a very, very good point you make. And again, with the pressure that Benny and Kuchi are putting up, they're making sure to not give an obscene amount of log value after that one mistake. He is Royal Delivery does hold off against that Balloon 487 on the right-hand side. We so far haven't seen the big spells able to be used on offense for Team K, so because of that graveyard, we'll see what that last card is in the hand of Benny, who so far no clue yet. You feel like it's a big spell, but maybe not. And just with one building in the hand of Michi and Diego E, it makes it very difficult to keep up with the pressure that's being applied with the Skeleton Barrel, the Miner, and then the Wall Breakers afterwards. So Benny and Kuchi just kind of outclass their opponents in Diego and Michi in game one. Yeah, I mean, that was very, very well played, well defended, and Maybe a bit of a snipe there when you look at the different pieces, the Inferno Tower, the Fireball for knockback on defense if they need it, but they didn't need it until the end. And then the Poison as well. It seemed like if, you know, we talk about how often 2v2 doesn't have a big matchup disparity, but you look at this one and it's almost like the defensive uh, build for Team Queso was made to defend against a balloon graveyard combination. Yeah, I mean, 150%. You throw the E-Wiz on top of there, nice little cherry on top, and it's so much stun. Also, that Royal Delivery, something that we saw there at the very, very end, helping on defense, they just had Cream's number with this matchup, and then the amount of pressure they were able to put on for very, very cheap, or just able to get a little damage on tower with a minor chip that would demand a drop. So you saw there, Snowball, Bomb Tower, Ewiz, all of those coming in and still damage comes in on that tower. So really, really great recognition by Benny and Kuchi to pick apart their opponent's defensive responses. Yeah, this is one of those ones where they put together a great performance and you feel like the Team Queso analyst might deserve a bit of a, a kudos, maybe a medal for himself, picking this deck, helping develop it for Kuchi and Benny. So game number one in the books for Team Queso. And again, we talked about this before, if Kuchi and Benny can win 50% of their 2v2s or even get that up to, you know, win five out of nine 2v2 sets over the course of this regular season, it feels like Team Queso should be able to carry themselves pretty well into playoffs and maybe even top four. Yeah, definitely. I think they have a pretty good ride to playoffs as long as Benny and Kuchi continue to do what we saw there in game number one. Now, the other thing that you have to think about with Diego's and Mitchie's decks is that they had two giant skeletons, which really don't pay off against what they were going up against. A giant skeleton being dropped right at the river to stop a massive push coming across, get a huge elixir trade. That's the point behind Giant Skeleton. That's its bread and butter. But when you have a deck that cycles that quickly, that's that cheap, you really can't find moments to get a ton of value. I mean, I think we called it the best value they got was that one log that Benny and Kuchi gave early on. It was like a log plus bar barrel. Never happened again. Giant Skeleton, basically useless. Yeah, it's one of those interesting things where we, we've talked a bit about this before, about why in 2v2 decks, you typically see both players running the same win condition as well. And these were two decks that were pretty similar across the board, except for the balloon and the graveyard. Mm -hmm. So another piece of this that we saw was that on defense, talking about the poison could just sit there and wait for the one graveyard. Typically, you double up that win condition so that you get the appropriate counters out of cycle. So they weren't able to have the appropriate pieces on defense themselves. And then on offense, they weren't able to force out the defensive responses they wanted to find an opening. So it was kind of a, uh, a cop in a rock in a hard place. Both sides of the board difficult for Cream Ray Albetis. So CRB and TQ going to come back into game number two, maybe going to reset here. I like what Queso did. I love to see those high skill decks in 2v2. I hope to see that again here in game number two. Here we go. Let's see if Diego E and Michifu can even things up as we jump in to the second game of our opening set. The bands one more time, Tornado and Musketeer out for this best of three. Yeah, and that Musketeer does make a big, big difference. And I'm wondering if that's why we saw the e -Wiz instead, which actually ended up paying off more for Team Queso. Yeah, I mean, double e -Wiz against the deck that's running Balloon, so. <laughs> It was, yeah, they were able to spend four Elixir with the Poison to defend against those graveyards, and then two e Wizzes and an Inferno Tower against the Balloon Freeze Push. Just real nasty. But it looks like they're going with a different construction here in game number two. Yeah, Hog Rider most likely. We see the Giant Skeleton and the Lumberjack. We've seen it with Ram Rider or Hog Rider. A lot of times we get a Magic Archer in the back. Works really well together. First minute away, slight damage lead so far for the cheesy ones, oh, and it's Royal mind. Giant this time. 
Well, I mean, you, you, you see the giant skeleton with the lumberjack. There are really two options. Most likely, as you said, it's the it's the the hog rider. But Royal Giant also works with a very similar construction. Yeah, Royal Giant Earthquake here going to work out. He was coming in last second to stop that stun. And Heal Spirit misplaced. Should have been behind the Dark Prince. Instead of in front, splash damage comes through. So there we go. Approaching the midway point of regulation time. And at the moment, it is a slight lead here for Team Queso, Cream Royale, Betis trying to find their way back in. And it's been interesting. We talk about players who adjust and turn towards the 2v2. It's kind of surprising that Michifu ended up being the 2v2 partner of Diego E as opposed to St. Pelican. Yeah, I mean, we just based off their history in CRL alone, wow, this balloon is just walking to the tower. Nothing they can do there. That should be no, just barely dies before the second drop, but Ooh. death damage will put that in a lot of trouble, and the high hunter will get pulled off by the fisherman. Yeah, hunter needs to get off the board quickly before that giant skeleton. Nope, giant skeleton takes the royal giant down. Death damage from the bomb, going to clean everything up here. And, oh, one belch through to even things up a bit, but about 1,200 HP difference. Team is having to go on defense right here against the giant skeleton. Royal Giant push, high Goblin Cage, Heal Spirit, get a little bit more here, and a defensive freeze, so Cream Royale Betis going with the same look as last time, the Balloon Graveyard Freeze combo, working out better so far at this stage, but it's Team Queso in the driver's seat with the pressure. Yeah, not enough cleaned off the board with that first defensive freeze that we saw, so now second Royal Giant comes in because there's still that Electro Wizard and Skeleton Dragon hanging out in the back with a very healthy giant skeleton on the board when that push started. And just like that, Benny and Kuchi scream back into this match. They are so far ahead on Elixir right now, Andrew. It's gonna be very difficult. Every single time that Diego and Michi play defense, they're overspending because they cannot get to those troops behind the Royal Giant and the Giant Skeleton right now. We'll see if this is their opportunity to get back into at least an even Elixir situation. Yeah, this is it right here, Rich. They need to make something happen right now. I don't even know if they go in with the Balloon. A high Giant Skeleton once again earning its pay. Graveyard and Balloon in. They don't have enough elixir for a freeze yet. Four elixir is what they need. Will they pull the trigger oh. here? Fireball in, log in. Four, Four remaining oh. on the tower. <laughs> oh, man. You knew there was more spells in the tank, but just for a second there, you were thinking Benny and Kuchi might sneak away with it. Here we go. This is what we wanted from these two squads. Even up through two games, Michi and Diego E bouncing back in game number two. They start off with a big, big offensive haymaker. Benny and Coochie really evened things up there for a bit. That was a non-stop Royal Giant Giant Skeleton drop at the bridge for about a whole minute there. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I, I'm going to go back with the replay on that one. Whether it was Benny and Coochie sacrificing the Elixir lead or just a better defensive adjustment for Michi and Diego E, but they were collectively down by about six, maybe seven Elixir as we got into the, the later moments of that matchup and able to recover and steal the win with the rarely seen freeze kill on that right hand tap. So here we go. This is their very first push coming across the river. It felt for a moment like they had it locked up. High Goblin Cage, E was there to stun, Skeleton Dragon's in the back, but you don't realize here that the Skeletons are tanking for the balloon and that Ewiz gets eaten alive by those bats. All of a sudden, that balloon's on tower, bomb drop in, and I think you and I both thought that was just gonna be towered down. They barely, barely got by with that. And we're joining that one a little bit late, Andrew, but that was the defense that got Cream Royale Betis back in the game. It was really impressive. They were down, like I said, by quite a lot of elixir and then able to just start putting the pressure on. They've been playing defense for about 90 seconds to two minutes before that, and suddenly with one big turn, they get it back, and as you saw, the rarely seen freeze to take the tower, fairly cool, and now we're going into a game number three all tied up. Yeah, and I think you called it perfectly during the game was just that there was a little bit of an overspend by Team Queso when they felt that they had their foot on the neck of Cream, but we've all done that. We've all gotten to that point where you realize they make a mistake, you punish, 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 but then all of a sudden on one of those exchanges, one of those encounters, they make a better trade than you do, and all of a sudden you still feel like you've got your gas on the, or your foot on the pedal, but you gotta take it off. You gotta reset, you gotta save some elixir for defense. If they would've had maybe two elixir more in each of their hands, maybe we see them take that tower. Yeah, distinctive possibility. And now the question is, does Cream Royale Betis go to that same idea one more time? They went huh. balloon <laughs> graveyard freeze twice in a row. Team Queso had their number in game number one. Game number two, they were able to get it back. 
it feels tempting to just go to the well one more time. It really does, but I think the thing that Team Queso really succeeded with in game number one was the ability to create pressure for very, very cheap. You can't do that with this deck, and you can't really do that with the Hog Rider deck with Giant Skeleton Muskets, or uh, Magic Archer. It's maybe a little bit easier, but I think I like Team Queso playing something a little bit faster. They're so experienced, they're so good at the game, they don't need to do this pile on at the river thing. I think they're better when they split up their attention. Yeah, I mean, we saw them go with the, the, the fast cycle in game number one. Wall Breakers working in 2v2, which, you know, it felt like it might have been a, a, a bit of a strange choice in the first one, but they're able to pull it out and get game number one. So here we go. This is a very important game number three. Yeah. Both teams have heavy hitters in the King of the Hill. Between the Michi-Pedro combination over on the Cream Royale Betta side, not knowing who the third player is going to be, and then, of course, Ruben and JP on the Queso side. Let's go jump in to the deciding game for our opening set. All right, just sitting back, hanging out, and there is our friend, the Goblin Cage, and once again, Giant Skeleton Lumberjack here out of Michi and Diego E. Yeah, very, very interesting. I want to see a swerve we'll here. See. I want him just I want to see him go opposite lane. Fireball in on the Skeleton Dragons, and Lumberjack... Let's see if it makes any sort of room here. Not really. And they might be going back to the well one more time here, Cream Rail Bets. Yeah, and <clears throat> I understand it because, you, you, you know, as an analyst, you go, there's no way they expect three times in a row. But it was definitely in the back of the mind, or in the back of my mind. I I, I don't know, man. I, I'm always a little iffy on, on running the same win condition three times. Giant Skeletons will meet at the bridge. A little extra room bought with the EWIS behind to take those Skeleton Dragons off the board. Although the second Skeleton Dragon will not get picked up by the EWIS for now. So it's going to help with this bridge fight. And it's now Team Queso setting up in the opposite lane. Yeah, that Snowball just pushing that one Skeleton Dragon a little far away. First 90 seconds away, no significant damage yet between these two teams, talking about 2v2 experience in CRL. Michifu did play some 2v2 back in 2019, the fall season, went 4-8 and eight overall in games. So far now in this season, 4-1, and one, or at this point, 5-2, and two. we talk about this match as well. And once again, Giant Skeleton in the back, so Looks like Benny and Coochie are going to go back to the Royal Giant. Yeah, we'll see how they mix in the Earthquake. So far, only one target for it, the Goblin Cage. And the Goblin Cage is a weird... It's an interesting target when you talk about Earthquakes, right? Because you can use the Earthquake to get it out of the way, but you still aren't getting the same sort of value you get when you use it on a traditional building because of that brawler that pops out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you talk always about getting spell value out on the board, and usually that comes at tower damage or unit damage, but basically Earthquake against a Goblin Cage gives you very, very medium tower damage and zero truth. So one big note about this one in game number three is the patience of Michi and Diego E. Maybe a bit too patient, taking a lot of damage in the left-hand lane, but we have not seen a single bit of real offense. This might be the first time, and there we go. Graveyard in on the left-hand side, and Giant Skeleton gets pulled deep into this one. Yeah, pulled very, very deep. Dangerous spot for that Giant Skeleton. I think Team Queso is going to be all right. No, they are not. Oh, Giant Skeleton boy. betrayed by their own fishermen. Well, the Fisherman is the Benedict Arnold of Clash Royale. Always pulling moves like that one. Let's see how Cream holds off against this Royal Giant push. Minute 45 left in Sudden Death Overtime. And the RG does get one shot, and now the pressure on, courtesy of Queso. Yeah, I mean, the only reason it feels like Michi and Diego E are even in this game is because of that crazy pull on that Giant Skeleton. Right now, Team Queso needs to capitalize on the fact that they have been in the driver's seat for this entire game until that one misplay. Oh, and the Lumberjack escapes, forcing out the Giant Skeleton, and you saw there the combination of the Freeze and the Lumberjack. Lumberjacks absolutely shred Royal Giants, so it seems maybe now they have the rhythm they want for that RG defense. We'll see if they can hold on here. This Giant Skeleton will pay off nicely for Cream. A rare miscommunication there between Team Queso double-dropping those Skeleton Dragons right on top of that Giant Skeleton bomb. Not what they want to use that Elixir for. That's a lot of Elixir waste. 
and the heal spirit survives the freeze and comes all the way back around. Royal Giant still does not get on tower, and now it's a full-on graveyard balloon push. Skeletons on the tower. This should That's be it. it. Cream Rail Bennett with the reverse sweep to open up our Saturday. Oh my goodness. Michifu and Diego B staying, or Diego E, excuse me, staying so poised through that final minute of gameplay. Benny and Kuchi, it felt like that small mistake, that small giant skeleton pull ended up being massive because of what it did to them mentally. They all of a sudden were playing catch up instead of playing calm. Yeah, that was a, a huge, huge difference. And yeah, you, you look, you sacrifice that extra four elixir and you feel, you start to get off. We talked about it before, mistakes beget mistakes. And a mistake like that one in this moment, Oh boy, Michi and Diego E capitalize well and go with the almost, they kind of meme it a little bit, going with the exact same deck three times in a row. Yeah, you know, I mean, Kuchi and Benny, they showed their hand early, right? So that's why you saw Michifu and Diego E really sit back for a long time. They knew what their opponents were running and they didn't want the same thing to happen to them that happened in game number two. So they were less aggressive with their graveyards, more aggressive with their balloons, and definitely more effective on their defense. And here we go. This was, I believe this is going to be the, there you go. Giant Skeleton comes down. I can't, I think this is the double drop here. Not entirely sure if that's the moment. We'll see. Giant Skeleton holding off against the Royal Giant. And it's going to be the next one, I believe, is going to be that uh, that double drop. Yeah, right And there. here we go. Four Giant Skeletons right into, or four Skeleton Dragons right into a Giant Skeleton. And you just can't afford that in this tight of a situation. Yeah, exactly. In this tight of a situation. If this was made at the beginning of Double Elixir and they were both sitting pretty, it would be maybe something they could come back from. Doing it right then and there when they have to get tower damage in, when they have to be as efficient as they can with their Elixir, there's just no way to come back. And again, it all came from that one fisherman pulling the giant skeleton in. Mentally, I think that was devastating to Team Queso. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think the, the thing you're saying there is mental devastation. And there were a few moments here where Team Kanto just, it felt like little mistakes stacked up and uh, continued to roll further and further. Now, this is also an important thing, Andrew. I said beforehand that maybe Creamer Albetis wasn't one of the elite 2v2 duos, and they may be making me eat my words. So far, 3 and 0 yeah. in sets is the Michifu Diego E combination. And a great, great reverse sweep. As you said, they called our bluff. They go three times in a row at the same win condition. They just change up the way they played it. So I don't know if that means for other squads out there, I can't imagine that they'll come out in their first match tomorrow with the exact same 2v2 deck, but at least it lets other analysts know they're not scared to run things back three times in a row, even if they get dominated in game number one, for instance. Yeah, it makes it very hard to game plan for them. And also with that double duty weekend, it does mean they didn't give us any looks at what they might be doing necessarily tomorrow as well. Wow. So yeah. in terms of game planning against them, there's a lot of value there. That's a really good point. I didn't even think about that. You run three of the same decks when you have two matches to play. Now they've burned one deck. They've literally burned essentially one deck in their arsenal of, or one combination of decks in their arsenal for 2v2. So great job there by their analyst, but it doesn't work unless the plays come through. So my hat's off to Diego E and Michifu. We both gave the edge to Team Queso in head-to-head -head play coming into this match. We gave the edge to Cream in 2v2. So far, we seem to be on the right track. What do you think about this King of the Hill? It's going to be an interesting King of the Hill. I think that... When you talk about each individual player, I think that Kareem Royal Bettis has a 1-2-3 lineup that doesn't have any weaknesses, mm -hmm. whereas in Team Queso, you have Ruben and JP, who are both top, top tier players, and then Kuchi and Benny, who I think fall just a little bit behind the three players of Kareem Royal Bettis. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Team Queso doing the same thing, front loading with JP and Ruben trying to blast through this lineup on their way into the 1v1. Yeah, and we see you guys in the live chat. We're in the same boat. We are so happy to have King of the Hill as the second set. Now, it's so many more competitors getting worked in every single match. Match, but like you said, it makes it so that every roster has to be fully, fully thought out. And the fact that Benny and Kuchi, as great as they are, fall a little bit short in head-to-head -head play here in 2020, it does become a very interesting position for Team Queso to be in. Do two superstars outweigh three more consistent head-to-head -head players? 
Well, it is an interesting conundrum, right? Because you look at a team like Kareem or Al Bettis, where Diego E can certainly play head to head. He's shown that in 2020. Mm -hmm. But part of their 2v2 duo is a killer like Michifu, right? Who is going to anchor Kareem or Al Bettis this time. Same thing you talk about. Uh, Space Station Gaming, you have AC and RF as the duo, and RF, one of the top head-to-head -head players on the planet right now. So it is an interesting difference for Team Queso versus the rest of the teams in the league. So here we go. Queso, IMJP, Ruben, and Kuchi for Cream Royale, Betis, Belican, X Pedro 15, and Michi. Let's hop into this first game of King of the Hill, where you'll see Belican at the top of your screen and IMJP here at the bottom for Team Queso. Yeah, the... Goblin Cage to open up for JP, and Belly going Night Witch. You don't see a ton of Night Witch these days in competitive, although uh, it is in a couple Lava Hound decks and in some giant Miner decks, but the likelihood of Golem Night Witch, very, very small, unless you are talking about the Clone King himself, St. Belly. I was going to say, I have definitely gotten rocked by some Golem clone once again, and it, it's disgusting. I hate it. And it's starting to feel just a little bit like it as we see Lumberjack, Baby Dragon, Night Witch, and the Skeleton. There it is. There's the clone. Not making us waste any time. Belican with a lot of dragons on that tower. That's a nasty early clone. 1603 on the left-hand side. And you almost have to start preparing for that. You have to have some sort of contingency for Belly running clone. He's going to do it once in every three games, it feels like. Yeah. And it is Golem clone. There it is. Crazy. Golem down in the back and come into this goblin cage. A reset on Elixir. IMJP is going to go on the aggressive Night Witch in response, maybe? Or does he just give the tower up? Oh my goodness. He's going full Golem clone. No shame. <laughs> oh boy. I don't know how many times I've seen Skeleton Army in CRL, Andrew. I don't know if I've seen it since, uh, I believe we saw Eddie running it on defense against Graveyards in CRL NA Season 1. But since then, I don't know how many times I've seen the Skeleton Army. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Eddie, Graveyards Season 1, I feel like a younger man is, is here on stage <laughs> once again. <laughs> And there was no response for the great for, for the for the skeleton army in that situation too. So, mm -hmm. not quite getting what he wanted because of the fishermen out of it. But you see why Belly was so happy to let that royal giant go. He had a response that he knew there was nothing to stop with in cycle. Yeah. So I was gonna say one of two things are gonna happen. Either Belican's gonna play into the weaker tower, or you can see what he's doing here. He is selling out knowing that he has to take this tower with this last golem clone push. I don't think he can put together another. Uh, I guess orchestrated push the way he'd like in 30 seconds. Yeah, this has to be it. I don't know how he's going to, and that Ooh. lightning comes in maybe a half step late, and this clone push is going to run ramshackle on that left-hand tower, and now we're going to go into a potential three-crown situation with the skeleton army in the pocket. That is nothing but trouble for IMJP and for me. I took St. Belican out of my lineup. Oh my gosh, why did I do that? Three crowns coming in for the Cream Real Betis and nothing but smiles here for same St. Belican. You called it. That lightning came in early. I mean, a second late, and you knew you know exactly what JP was going for. Take those units off the board before they're able to get cloned, and then drop the E-Wiz on top to clean up whatever is cloned. The only problem is, is if you miss either of those timings, you lose the match. It really does feel like you just have to have you have to have something that clears out clones when you're playing against St. Belican. You really can't plan again without that. And you look at JP's deck, Lightning, Barb Barrel. For the aerial clones, the best thing he has is a heal spirit, it feels. I guess maybe the E is, but that's gonna get eaten alive by the troops that it drops into. Yeah, and then the baby dragon is so easily distractible, her splash damage is not gonna come in the way you'd like. So Sam Belican having a great matchup and also great decision making. You know, uh, some players would have went into that weaker tower in that moment thinking, look, I can probably defend this and I'll get a good counter push on that right hand lane, then I don't lose my tower. A lot of Golem Cone players are always going to go for that three crown, though, and that's exactly what happened. You saw him do it two times in a row, and IMJP just could not respond to the Skarmy. And this was a pretty big time first clone push, and opportunistic choice there by Belican just gets the defense off the board and gets some significant tower damage in early. And then here we go. This was the, I believe this is the final push here, and it's just what happens. Look at this. The Lightning's going to come yeah. in just behind. Too many clones on the board already. GG, well played. Huge, huge push for St. Bell. And then you can even see there at the end of the replay, IMJP trying to figure out where 
on earth do I drop this Ewiz to get good enough value out of it? But I'm pretty sure he already knew the game was lost the second that Lightning didn't hit the units that it needed to. That clone comes in, you know it's gonna be coming in. You've already spent Elixir on the right-hand side. It's just one of the most frustrating things when you're playing against a good Golem player is their ability to recognize when they can ignore and attack because that's usually, at least when I'm playing against Golem, that's usually how I lose. Is I'll be in the lead, I'll be in the lead, Elixir-wise, damage-wise, and then finally they'll sacrifice damage and elixir to create a massive push that is just unstoppable yeah and i you know i, I don't know i'm not keeping stat uh, track of the stats the same way as i have in the past i'll have to go check out some of the details after the the broadcast is over today but i don't know how many times we've seen golem in 1v1 in the last year and a half yeah much less right now i i mean i i feel like we'd probably count it on one hand truly I really yeah. do. I mean, I yeah. think there was a moment there because you said last year where like there was a little bit more Golem clone, but a very, very big departure from what we saw in our first couple seasons or our first maybe three seasons of casting. Now, back in the meta, I guess, kind of. I can't imagine he runs it again, and I can't imagine he even runs it again in the first game of the rest of the King of the Hills this season for Cream. But you know what? He ran it today and it worked out brilliantly. Yeah, worked out very, very well. So St. Belican adding his fifth King of the Hill win on the season. Not a lot of players currently at five wins in King of the Hill. I'll have those numbers for you in just one minute. And now we go into our game number two, Ruben, who is currently 5-0 and oh overall in King of the Hill. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy to think how much we've spoken about the dominance, the sheer dominance of Ruben. But then you talk about a guy in St. Belican whose numbers are basically the same. And honestly, I think if, based off what you just said, if he beats Ruben right now, he's going to be in a better position. So St. Belican doing it all for Cream Real Betis. And like you said, he's not even their 1v1 star. So you got Michifu starting things off great in 2v2 with Diego E. Belican, who has been a powerhouse in King of the Hill. And Expatriot 15, who everyone in the world knows is an S-plus tier player has just kind of been able to hang back, which is really, I, I don't know, it, it can work out or it can be a negative because you also want that guy to get reps and you want him to get comfortable. Do you think Pedro's gonna suffer from that at all or do you think he's just so experienced he's happy to let his team do that work for him? Well, Pedro's a guy who is, of course, getting reps outside of CRL at the moment. And I think that once you've sort of broken through that thing of being in CRL and you're comfortable, mm -hmm. which he clearly is, I'm not as worried about how many reps you're getting in actual CRL game day stuff because it's really a nerves question. His skill level, certainly high because he's playing like crazy. It's really just where are you comfort level playing on stream during the big time matches. And that's not a problem for Pedro. You know, so we're three weeks in. You know, and uh, speaking of problems, which is something you kind of got to look for. Obviously, in the last season, it was like after match day one, you were like, well, that's a huge problem. They've got three matches left and they're, you know, now three, three weeks in the books. Team Queso looking pretty good. Ruben looking great. What about IMJP? IMJP has only picked up one game win so far in his very first King of the Hill matchup against Wings. So a great win there. But I believe... Team Queso and all Team Queso's fans are expecting a little bit more out of IMJP. Why do you think he's struggling so much right now? Well, it's still early in the season. You know, he's he's played in three matches, one th and four games, won one and lost three. Uh, it's it's part of that as being the first guy up, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't get a look at anybody. You just come out maybe a little bit cold. You come out with sort of one chance to get a win here. Um, my big curiosity is do we ever see IMJP get a shot in the 1v1 set where he has room to kind of stretch his wings a little bit? I'm going to reserve judgment on, what, on where what kind of form JP is in so far. Mm -hmm. He's had some tough matchups. For me, if this kind of win rate currently 1 and 3, if it continues on through next weekend, that's when I start to get worried about JP. But at this stage, it just feels like, hey, it's, a four, it's four games. If he had won one of those four games, he'd be 50-50 right now. Instead, he's 1 and 3. Three. So I'm not concerned yet. I'll reserve that concern after we see this weekend and next weekend. And that's a really fair point you make. You and I would not be having this conversation otherwise um, if he was two and two. So I am JP. You know, verdict is still out on him. We all know the talent that he has and the caliber of player that he is. But it's about translating that here to match day. That being said, King of the Hill lineup. IMJP in the first spot. Do we still want to keep him there? Very, very low pressure, but coming in cold. Uh is it better to put him in later on where he might be coming off of a win or does putting him in later on just make the pressure exponentially worse? 
It's interesting because I see the thought process behind Team Queso, right? They want to come out and just hit you hard uh, right in the opening moments. But the only problem with that is you come out and you do that and you're, you're putting a lot of pressure on JP in the front end. And then if they get down to the last player, King of the Hill, Coochie or Benny, it's a different kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. I would switch it around. I would go ahead and put Coochie or Benny out front and then move someone to the back, in my opinion. So just a reminder of what you're about to see here. St. Belican will be facing off against Ruben, two of the best King of the Hill lineups here in 2020. Let's go. And thanks for bearing with us, everyone on a little bit of this delay here, trying to get some of these technical issues sorted out. Here we go, jumping into game number two, King of the Hill, and looking pretty similar on both sides so far. Yeah, it happens, you know, that whole, uh, let's take a look at our first match of the day, and then I just smile at the camera. So, uh, you know, we all, we all make mistakes here and there. <laughs> so here we go, it's gonna be not the exact same look on both sides, at least. So far, Belican probably running Mortar Skeleton Barrel, but it's mm -hmm. Minor Wall Breakers, and no, they're both gonna be going Minor Wall Breakers, so it might end up being a mirror match here. Yeah, and right now, Ruben off to a substantial lead. You see a bit of a shake of the head there from Belican. This is gonna be easily cleaned up with the log there by Ruben. And just like that, Rich, in a mirror matchup, when you are that far behind this early on, it's incredibly demoralizing. Yeah, it certainly can be frustrating, and. The wall breakers there out of Ruben just to slow down a bit. They do not prevent both connections. So St. Belican coming out good in that exchange does have the dual lane pressure, but that 1538 on the top right hand side certainly going to be an issue as we move into the midway point of our opening three. Yeah, and this is a moment where I wish I could really look into the mind of St. Belican because he seems a lot more frustrated than the position that he's put in right now kind of. Uh, I get it. I get being upset with that big time connection on the right hand side early on, but he is playing wall breakers against wall breakers. If he's able to stop that for long enough and he just gets one connection, he can even this game up. That's a very, very nice move out of Ruben. You just saw he was ahead by three elixir and went with the miner to pull the knight back behind. And because of that, now he's beginning to extend that elixir lead just a little bit up by one now and should get a decent counter push because it should be pretty easy to handle this night on the right hand side yeah and that elixir deficit in a mirror matchup with these as these cards as your win condition it is a massive difference massive we're talking about and look at that wall breaker connection yeah. belican falls for it a second time puts the knight right in front of the princess tower Ruben pulls it back behind with the miner and gets massive damage. This is some beautiful play and maybe some slight mental missteps out of Belican. Yeah, Cream Real Bet is just wanting to stop the bleeding now. 30 more seconds. Belican screaming, get me out of here. Log comes in on top of the tower. Spear Goblin's back in with the miner in the backside. St. Belican just behind on Elixir for this entire, entire match. Brutal, brutal pressure out of Ruben and Looks like he's got this one fairly well in control. 291 on the left-hand side goes Miner to the number three spot high and inside. Belly calls the good game. He knows that's it. Beautiful gameplay by Ruben. And again, twice getting that Miner pull on the night. Belly fell for it once and then fell for it again. Yeah, you know, when you were talking about IMJP moving into the 1v1, it's not a bad idea unless you have a teammate in Ruben. When you have a guy that's that Good. How do you not put him in that 1v1 spot? So Ruben coming out, putting it to St. Belican with the mirror matchup, just outplaying him, honestly. Maybe it was starting hand. Belican didn't have the, quite the correct responses, or he just didn't respond the way he should have in that opening push. But Ruben here bringing Team K so even in the King of the Hill set. So you see at this point, lots on the board right now for Ruben, able to put in good dual lane pressure. And we're getting pretty close to the end here with this damage on the left-hand side. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly what you're talking about throughout that matchup, Rich, which is that massive elixir deficit that St. Belican's in. The ability that Ruben has to create a massive amount of pressure on both sides of the board. I mean, he's just dead in the water here. There's no way to respond. There's no way to come back. And Ruben, the only way he loses this is if he, you know, he just stops playing defense. He has so much elixir in hand that he just can't drop the ball. Yeah, you fall behind that early, as you said, in a quick cycle mirror match, and you better come up with a rabbit out of your hat. No chance here in this one. Ruben taking a very important King of the Hill win for Team Queso. Remains undefeated in King of the Hill 6-0 oh, 
so far in set number two. Yeah, well, I know someone that's going to want to say something about that, and it's Pedro. X Pedro 15 coming up next to face off against Ruben. That will most likely be our 1v1 matchup if we do get to that third and final set. This is a big one right here. Can someone beat Ruben in King of the Hill? When you get a guy that's as good as he is in 1v1 and as good as he is in King of the Hill, that's a terrifying thing, and that's exactly why Team Queso is starting to build a squad around this young star. So far, King of the Hill hasn't been Pedro set. 31% life, lifetime win rate in King of the Hill. Much better in the third set in 1v1, where he's a 55% win rate overall. This is a guy who does excel overall in longer sets with all of his big-time wins, including the Bren Chong Cup win earlier this year. So... I don't know. I think I, I feel pretty good about Ruben's chances here in King of the Hill. The big question will be how they go in a full-on best of three if we do end up getting to the third and final set. Yeah, because right now, both squads' first guys, or I guess they're, they're the guys that have picked up their first win in each set, have done their job. Ruben's done his job by picking up one. Belican has definitely done his job by picking up one. This is where we're going to start to see if the wheels fall off at all for either squad. Ruben being as good as he is, if he just mows through cream here in this King of the Hill set, that's that's brutal because you know that he's going to see either Belkin or most likely ex Pedro in that last set. And if he does it to him here, we all know how that usually goes in the 1v1 set, unless you're Javi 14, who always. Yeah. Get, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, unless you're Avi, who lost that King of the Hill and then came and roared back in the 1v1 for that win to keep SK perfect. I think the pressure is a little bit higher on Ruben, though, in this matchup because Pedro knows he has a top-tier player in Michifu behind him. And no slight on Kuchiku, but you're talking about the Kuchiku versus Pedro and Michifu matchup. I don't love Kuchi's chances of getting through both of those players if Ruben stumbles here in game number three. Yeah, and that is really just a testament to the strength and the depth of this roster from Cream. So here we go. Game number three, King of the Hill. Ruben, as I said before, still undefeated in this second set. Six and oh with one sweep. You saw a little bit of body language reaction there from Ruben when he saw that barb hut coming down. I don't think he's the most excited to see it. Probably gonna go back to what we just saw him run. Could be the mortar variation, uh, but I don't believe it is. It feels like he'd probably go right back to wall breakers. Yep. And there he goes, minor right to the musketeer on that right hand side and wall breakers gonna go directly into that barb hut. Big question is whether or not Ruben can outcycle this during single elixir and get some significant damage. So far, the answer is no. Yeah, needs to do that. Needs to get this damage in, in single elixir as this deck he's playing cycles so quickly, it creates a lot of pressure. That barb hut, though, is going to be a menace. That knight out of Ruben, though, was absolutely gorgeous. Bomb tower in response for the pigs, and then the knight helps clean up the piggies and gets a perfect kite on the skeleton dragons and this might be it is yeah. a double wall breaker connection pedro calling good game early just like that and the reason he's calling good game early is because now he has opened the door for ruben to create massive amounts of pressure wherever he'd like that damage coming in it makes pedro favor the right hand side of the map so what's ruben going to do defend cheaply on the right and start creating pressure on the left Musketeer in response to the Barb Hut. No swings come in. Approaching the final minute, double Elixir on its way. And it's going to be hard to see if Pedro can find any way past the Bomb Tower Log combination, which should be able to defend fairly well against these Royal Hawks. Bit of fortune there for Pedro, that Musketeer coming off the board. A lot of fireball value in. And Miner goes right to the back, extending the lead for the Spaniard. Pedro in a whole lot of trouble. 45 seconds left to work. Can he put some sort of significant offense on the board? And the decision making here by Ruben has been perfect so far, making the exact correct elixir commitment when and where he needs. Well, the wall breakers just to put some damage on that bar button, not letting, not, not being concerned about getting damage from the wall breakers, did get it through one time, but using them more from a defensive standpoint, getting that bar putt down and out. Great, great choices here by one of the best in the business. Yeah, and Ruben has fully committed to this right-hand push there. The double drop of the log plus the knight to protect the musketeer for just a second logger. Really, really nice play there, but this is where Ruben starts to get in trouble. Look at his elixir count. Here we go. Pigs on the left-hand side. 
but a bomb tower does hold on, although here we go, a little bit of damage coming in. We go into sudden death overtime, and Pedro now has begun to put a bit more pressure on. And this is exactly what can happen with this dual lane pressure deck from Pedro. We know how pesky those hogs can be. Pouring them on the left-hand side because Ruben has committed to the right is now going to be what Pedro's going for. There you go, skeleton bat dragons in the back. Miner into the back, picked up by the skeletons and forced to play the fireball just for an even 4-4 trade. Bomb Tower, though, should be more than ready for this next Hogs push. There we go. Yeah, Bomb Tower in. Pedro not gonna fireball that as it is way too much Elixir committed, so we get some Skeleton Dragons down up high to clean up those Spear Goblins. And nice play with the fireball using the Skeleton Dragon to get the Musketeer off the board on the right-hand side. Pigs in and Ruben, oh, no. very, very low here, forced to get a late fireball out. We'll have a lead here, but that lead is much smaller than it was before. Yeah, and all of a sudden, that cushion that he's had for this entire match slowly dissipating. 474 HP remaining on the top right for Pedro, but Pedro feels like he's got his defense locked. So there's that early log coming in to look for the skeletons. Great oh. plays by Ruben. And he can cycle fairly quickly here to get back and finish this one off. Yep. Goes ahead and throws the Miner up front. Not going to need the Fireball. Miner log. Ruben, two up, two down. Still perfect in King of the Hill. Ruben recognizing what Pedro had and how he liked to defend. And the fact that he knows Pedro's good enough to start switching things up. Because that's exactly what Pedro did on that last, or second to last Miner. Miner goes in with the log. Skeleton late drop. Instead, he puts the Musketeer down for defense. Ruben calls it with a great Fireball. And that... That is gonna do it. Pedro screams back into the game, but Ruben holds that lead just long enough. The early bomb tower from Ruben on defense in the end really just sort of sat there and told Pedro, you are not gonna control the rhythm of these last few moments. And you gotta wonder if maybe Pedro was hoping to get better timing and a bomb tower when he didn't expect it, totally changing the rhythm. And here we go. That was the big connection Two wall breakers gave a huge lead. And at that point, Pedro knew he was in trouble. And the reason he knows he's in so much trouble is not only is it because of the damage on the tower, it's the amount of elixir he spent to still allow that damage to come in. Heal Spirit plus Log plus Skeletons. That's four Elixir spent to defend against five and take that much damage. That's a huge, huge mistake. And you see the second Bomb Tower able to come down on defense. So, so much done by Ruben there at the end to mess up the rhythm of Pedro. Played a Bomb Tower, forced the game to be played on his terms, got back around to a second Bomb Tower right as those pushes came in. GG, well played. Ruben currently having a good shot at becoming the first player with two King of the Hill sweeps in this fall split. Yeah, two sweeps in three weeks. Wow, sounds like something that Ruben would do. Ruben now 2-0 and oh on the day. Michifu, last guy up to stop him from going into the third and final set. Now, coming into the King of the Hill, we were saying that we give Queso the slight edge based off of Cream running the 2v2. It felt like maybe they were a little bit more even. However, if Ruben 3 owes them in King of the Hill, we know he's going to come back out in 1v1. We know that there's no conversation about saving decks for Ruben. He's got all of them. Um... This is trouble for Cream. This spells a lot of trouble for Cream, and this is the moment for Michifu to do kind of what other teams have expected him to do in the past, which is come through in head-to-head -head play. Yeah, this is a big one. If Michi wins this one, he has a pretty good chance of, you know, of coming out and having a good performance against Kuchiku. This feels like it might be a decider of the set in terms of these two. Ruben wins this one, though. Man, I, I don't like anyone's chances in a BO3 against Ruben, unless your name is Javi. Yeah, 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 exactly, unless your name is Javi. And, and honestly, Pedro has been struggling a bit here in 2020 fall. So here we go. Michifu, last up for Cream Real Betis. He's gonna be on the top of your screen. Ruben at the bottom, perfect on the day. Perfect in King of the Hill. With that win, Ruben does move to an 80% win rate overall this season, 64% lifetime overall win rate in CRL. Does he just do it again, Rich? Does he just rock it three times in a row? Because Cream, no, he does not. I like this change. I like mm -hmm. this change. Looking like it's going to be hog triple spell here. Uh, you know, going still with a deck that has cycle capability, outplay capability but a little bit different look than he gave the first two. Exactly, and that's a really, really good point that you make. Outplay and cycle capability, as we've seen the top tier players in the world, they love that, that's their bread and butter, but still switching up the win condition from what we've seen. 
Yeah, Michi looking like it's Graveyard here. And Graveyard will be interesting. We'll you know, a lot Go of ahead. spells, skeletons on the board, quick cycle to create opposite lane pressure. Ruben could be happy with what he's seeing. Gonna get a little bit more of a lead here on the right-hand side. We'll see how much of a lead Ruben can create during the first three minutes or so, three or four minutes. It's a big question of how big that is. If Michifu can hold on and not give up too much damage, once we hit triple, it's going to be very difficult for Ruben to play defense and put damage on tower. Yeah, it's not just about overtime anymore. It's all about that double and triple. And we've seen decks like what Michifu is running just dominate in triple elixir because you can get that graveyard after graveyard after graveyard. And those barb huts are so cheap. Ruben just puts a little bit on that musketeer. Good timing with the log. Knight come out to protect for Michifu. Yeah, the one thing about Ruben goes for an early graveyard. is that it feels like he's just always one step ahead. Well, he's very, very good at keeping his focus and making game time adjustments. And we saw that out of Ruben in game number one today against Belican. And we'll see if he can do that here, although this is feeling more and more challenging. Does have good damage on the right hand side, but so does Michi. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and and as you said, as time goes on, this matchup starts to favor Michi more and more. However, that earthquake log combination, being able to get all those units in the Musketeer and the Barb Hut, is going to prove to be a lot of trouble here for Michi Fu. Little bit of tanking, not doing much. Skeletons in the back. And you see Michi not able to pull the trigger on a poison. So the one elixir skeletons get a lot of defensive duty in. But just like that, we are separated by 137 HP in the right hand lane. Yeah, what a fire back there from Michifu, able to put so much on the board and keep that knight occupied so that his dragons can come and get a little bit more splash damage on the tower. Really nicely played. And again, you see the Skeletons being the primary defensive tool for Ruben, but he's falling further and further behind. Oof. And right now it is Michi with a significant elixir advantage. Yeah, and one more belch in from that Skeleton Dragon is going to be a lot of trouble here. Now, Ruben has to go back on offense. He has to do it. I don't know if he can here, Andrew. A lot on the board. Giant skeleton or Skeleton Dragons in high. Graveyard oh, down low, it. and this should be it. Michifu stops the train, finally gives Ruben a King of the Hill loss. And that is a massive, massive win for Cream. So, so important for them to take the win here today because Kuchiku, I don't know which version of Kuchiku we're going to see, but we haven't seen anything but perfection from Ruben, and now Michifu coming through once again for his squad today. What a day for Michi. Yeah, that's a big, big King of the Hill win for Michifu. That's very, very important. And now a chance to close things out early. Pedro would love to have a chance to just sit back, relax, and prepare for next weekend. If Michi can beat Kuchiku in this next game, that means that Pedro goes into next to, to their tomorrow's match completely fresh. Yeah, Michifu now three crowns on the day could end up taking two full sets and it was all about that patience. You said it at the very beginning. It's not about the first couple minutes. It's going to be about those last couple minutes. You know, once we get three or four minutes into the game, then what's going to happen? Well, I'll tell you, Rich, it's a lot of what we're seeing right here on the replay. Yeah, and, and Ruben was doing okay early on, but you saw that Michifu was able to get a lot, of da lot more damage in single elixir in the first three minutes than Ruben would have liked. Mm -hmm. And so instead of being able to put pressure on and play really comfortable defense, Ruben was having to play like significant actual defense and be worried about putting damage on the opposite side. And when you get into those later moments, not going to happen in this matchup. Yeah, and this is maybe a moment where if you guys want, you can maybe at me on Twitter politely, but... I don't know if Ruben should have kept going into that same right lane. I don't know if, you know, in single elixir, he was giving a lot of spell value with the poisons early on. That's why Michifu was able to kind of sit back. He was focusing on the one tower that Michi was going to commit to eventually. So I don't know if it's a matchup thing because I don't really ever play Hog Rider. It's like my least favorite win condition. Would it have been better for him to go to the left hand side just to maybe break up what Michi was able to put together for so long? It's an interesting, it's a, it's a hard conversation because Michifu 
you know, depending on when you do that, that left hand tower was totally untouched, right? So a hog rider completely untouched is going to get seven hits. That's a ton of damage. Michi would have had to spend something most likely either a knight for three elixir for a plus one trade or a musketeer at distance that could then support in the right hand lane. Right. So you're kind of caught in a really difficult spot there if you're Ruben to switch lanes against this deck. Yeah, because either way, like you said, Michi can defend, take a lot of damage because he's very healthy over there and then still get that push on the right hand lane. So here we go. Kuchiku, last man up for Team Queso. Likewise for Michifu here for Cream. Kuchiku, lifetime in the King of the Hill set, does have a 56% win rate, 10 and 8, throughout his career, with one King of the Hill sweep back in the spring season of 2019. Yeah, and this would be a huge, huge win for Kuchi. Lava Hound into the Royal Giant, and Michifu going RG behind King Tower in single elixir. Typically not what you think of doing with Royal Giant, usually if you go in single, you go at the bridge, but this time just setting up big in the back. We'll see if Kuchiku can capitalize here. Yeah, Kuchi taking a lot of damage, and I don't think he's going to get much out of it here. Minor into the back. The bar barrel does not distract the fisherman. A lot more close than I think Michifu would like here when it is in regards to damage, but now both gentlemen know what they're facing up against. And that fish slap does extend the lead for Michifu. Lava Hound in front of the Night Witch for Kuchi as we pass the first 90 seconds. Baby Dragon going to focus on that Night Witch and Bats. Really nice placement there. And the high E was coming in, I think, a second early. Nope, a great heal spirit to keep it on the board. Really nicely played. High Skeleton Dragons in support on this Lava Hound on the right-hand side. And the Lava Hound alone is going ahead, getting the lead right now for Kuchiku. Minor in, and the low bar barrel does not come out to the miner. This is absolutely huge for Queso and Kuchiku. Yeah, that is a big misplay. Maybe get to see an RG at the river. No, Michifu going to completely reset as he is not doing great elixir-wise and not doing great damage-wise either. Now, in a two-tower game, I definitely think that Michifu still has a chance, but this is not the position he wanted to put himself in. Yeah, we have not seen the big spell, and there we go. Lightning does get the flying yeah. machine off, and Baby Dragon might be enough to help this Royal Giant. No, 463, so one more push gonna have to come in for Michifu on the right-hand side, and he's trying to go pressure with his low-cost troops wow. right now, and he will get the tower. Yeah, Kuchi just gonna sacrifice it, recognizing if he put too much more pressure on defense, he maybe wouldn't be able to put something together offensively, but this now is what I'm talking about when it comes to a two-tower game. Royal Giant in the pocket, pushed back by the Goblin Cage, and that Night Witch Ooh. and Brawl are going to spend some long time in the back. Miner might go to the E-Wiz here, and I, no, it does not. I was just going to say, that Miner coming in is so brilliant. A Lightning 100% was going to come down. Kuchiku keeps his Flying Machine alive, which in turn is going to give him a good amount of damage on this tower. That Miner was everything. Brilliant. Brilliant play by Kuchiku, and just like that, he storms into the lead. Great, great block there. Great pickup, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, if we can see that on replay, we got to check it out again. Just the wherewithal there from Kuchiku in this moment, being down when he was to get that miner up. Very, very brilliant play. Lava Hound down one more time. Miner going into the back. He needs this time picked up by the Ewiz. I think Kuchiku's gonna take this. He does not have enough single target damage. Flying machine in the pocket. That's it. G G well played. Kuchiku comes in clutch in game number five and sends this to the third and final set. That is as clutch as it gets. What a back and forth battle there. But now, and you can see on Michifu's face, he knows the position that his team is in, which is that they have to beat Ruben in 1v1. Can it be done? I think so. Will it be done? For cream's sake, let's hope. Yeah, that's going to be an absolute beast of a matchup. We'll go ahead and take a look at some of these moments here, and I believe this is what you're talking about, Andrew. What a brilliant, brilliant miner. It comes in, and the Lava Hound Night Witch Miner block the lightning for the flying machine, and that's just a high IQ play 
knowing the relative HPs of your troops. Exactly. Knowing the HPs of your troop and also knowing the best decision in the world to make for your opponent. There was only one response. I knew it, Michifu knew it, but most importantly, Kuchi knew it. He knew that lightning was gonna come in on top of those three troops that do so much damage. If you protect even one of them, you are going to take that tower. He protects the flying machine, the most annoying of all the units to leave on the board, and that is gonna do it. And a great heads up flying machine in the pocket there to steal this game. Kuchiku doing what you'd expect if you're Team Queso. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's why you put him in the anchor spot here. And uh, Kuchi making some people eat their words, including myself with a big time win and an outplay in that moment, extending his King of the Hill record to 11 and eight, a 58% win rate in King of the Hill. So despite being negative in win rate in 2v2 overall, including today, Kuchi comes out with maybe a more important win, setting up what is most likely going to be Ruben for a big 1v1 showdown in this third and final set. You know, we don't need to get into specifics because I don't think it serves anybody, but there are very few 2v2 players that you put into the closing spot of King of the Hill. There's a couple out there that you can mention, someone like Morton maybe, but for the most part, you don't expect that a lot. I mean, sometimes we'll see him in the, in the first spot or the second spot, but to close things out and play 2v2 and be a guy that could pop in at any time like Kuchiku does, beat anybody on any given day, that's why he's still rostered. That's why Team Queso still has so much faith in him and Benny is because high pressure situations, life on the line, guess who comes through? It's the guy that's been there since day one. Look, you can lose all the 2v2s you want as long as you clutch out <laughs> King of the Hill. And like I said before, if Team Queso can win five of the nine 2v2 sets this season, it feels like they not only walk their way into playoffs, but maybe walk their way into that top four as well, especially once we get into the playoff format with those BO5-3 1v1 sets. Yeah, I mean, the crazy thing is, is Ruben being such an X factor, it's like... If Queso takes the 2v2, they probably just win. If Ruben is not stopped in either of those sets, they probably just win. So it becomes this really, really tough spot to be in. We already know Ruben's gonna come out, and I imagine it's gonna be Pedro for Cream. Is that the correct decision right now based off what we've seen from Pedro? Yes, 1v1 is his better set, but I don't know. There just seems to be something a little bit off about the Cream Real player. I think you have to stick with Pedro for now. Belican is certainly a fine player, but I think deck pool wise, Pedro has a bit more variety. Belican has a few decks that he kind of leans on significantly in competitive play. And I, I like going with someone who's a little bit less predictable in ex-Pedro. So here we go. Zero, zero, set number three, all on the line up to these two stars. Talking about some of Pedro's overall head-to-head -head Credentials, of course, that win in the Bren Chong Cup earlier this year, back in the spring, was a huge one, but also made number three in CCGS Latin America back in the spring of 2017. So he's been good in head-to-head -head play for a very long time. His head-to-head -head win rate overall in CRL in his career, 54%. Maybe a Royal Giant here coming out for Pedro. Graveyard in response. Oh. And that lightning cleans up quite a bit there high, and the graveyard not going to get a whole lot. Baby Dragon, easy defense at the stage. Yeah, nice, nice lightning there. Going to just let this Baby Dragon go. No, he's actually going to pile on here with the Bar Barrel plus the Heal Spirit, looking at the cards he had in the tank, also looking at how he could capitalize. It does force out the Skeleton Dragons. They won't get a lot of damage. My guess here is Pedro eats that and comes out with a one to one and a half Elixir lead. Yeah, what does he do? There we go, 90 seconds away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sets up, just banks now at this point. Yeah, yeah, good call there. Goblin Cage, always a great cycle card if you know you can't get punished by something like a Balloon or Hog Rider. Get that on the board. It's gonna pop here in a second. You can see how you wanna support it. And setting up Royal Giant in the back, not really concerned about an opposite lane pressure push now that he knows what he's up against. So Ruben doing the correct thing here, just gonna hang back, cycle stuff in the back. Maybe give an opening for Lightning again, but I don't think that Pedro gets that aggressive. Now in double Elixir. Yeah, Lightning, there you go. I think we're going to see that. Every mm -hmm. time you see a Musketeer 
with even one other value troop, but especially with those skeleton dragons on the board, I think we're going to see Pedro just try to get the, get her off the board as much as possible. She is the highest DPS in Ruben's hand. Yeah, I mean, you're making a 6 for 8 trade right there. Who cares about the tower damage? You don't have to deal about tanks coming across the river for this graveyard. So, oh, speaking of tanks, those skeleton dragons tanking for that musketeer that is getting tanked for by the graveyard. And there you go, value, negative, negative 2 trade, but tower damage and put a little bit on the tower as, or I'll get the musketeer off the board as well. Here we go, final 10 seconds. And the deeper this goes, the more opportunity it is for Ruben to cycle graveyards, but this lightning, an absolute X factor in this game. Yeah, and a lot of elixir spent right there at the river from Ruben. However, Barb Barrel does connect. Do we see another lightning here? I don't think so. I think Pedro, wow, he is gonna go for it. Will he get punished? I don't know, he's he's only behind by about two elixir. I guess the knight does add a little bit more into Ruben's side, but you know, Pedro Pedro just knows that he can defend for positive traits consistent, consistently, so why not give up one negative trade to stop something early? Yeah, and honestly, now he's already back to another lightning, which if he drops in the correct spot, is gonna be very difficult to do. He should be able to clean up those units in the back. Ooh, and he missed it. Second Musketeer down, and this Royal Giant now getting absolutely shredded by Ruben. Knight down, second set of Skeleton Dragons. This is a lot of pressure in the right-hand lane. Yeah, I mean, I, it, there was no way. That Lightning misses what the units he needs to hit were, which was, I'll give him credit. I'll, I'll give him a pass on the second Musketeer because it dropped maybe the second that the Lightning came down, but he needed to hit the one Musketeer and the two Skeleton Dragons. The fact that one of those was soaked up by the Knight was devastating when you talk about DPS and winning a bridge battle for Pedro. So Ruben now three and one on the day. Overall, one win away from securing this four team queso and starting Cream's doubleheader weekend off the wrong way. Yeah, that's a, that is a very interesting way to put it. Cream doubleheader, obviously two matches coming in tomorrow. They'll be facing off against Payne, so maybe a little bit easier on paper, but you never know. And based off what Pedro has done so far in head-to-head -head play, is there something to be worried about for Cream? No, I guess maybe by the end of tomorrow we'll be able to make a better decision on that. Yeah, it just seems right now like Cream has pieces working, but not all working at the same time. Ooh. And yeah, you see it gets one Musketeer down off, but the second Musketeer down in the back. And Ruben just able to put a whole lot of pressure on, and a lot of it was just not over pressure with graveyards here. Yeah, and, and Ruben did a really brilliant thing there and making it incredibly difficult to target what Pedro wanted. Obviously, by pouring more and more units on right there at the bridge, he's got to drop that lightning perfectly. And honestly, I don't know if there was a way to get the Musketeer and the two Skeleton Dragons because he played that Goblin Cage so high, which is why I think it came down. Um, because it was it play, it was played so early that the Royal Giant didn't even need to cross the river. But what it did do was made that lightning impossible to hit. So, you know, we saw it earlier with the Miner, seeing it again now with the Goblin Cage. I think the fascinating thing here about this matchup, Andrew, on the Cream side of it, is that the place where it felt like Cream was strongest was head to head between the yeah. the, the the two v, the two and two duo of uh, of Michi Fu and Pedro as two head to head stars, and then Belly and Diego who can both come in and get big time wins and big time spots. But it's turned out to be the other way around where they are three and zero in sets in two v two, but cannot seem to get it together in their head to head after that opening King of the Hill sweep for Belly. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is. It, it right like you feel like with Michi Pedro Belican. Michi or Pedro come in that final set, but you talk about practice, practicing with each other, practicing with other CRL pros. It is quite odd that the place that they struggle in is I think the place that everyone found them to be the biggest threat. You think Saint, Belican, Michi Fu, and Pedro and King of the Hill moving into the 1v1 set, and that's where you really gotta worry about Cream. 2v2 is gonna be easy money. Not the case at all. Well, the hard part here with Cream is they're having so much success in 2v2 that you don't want to break up Diego E and Michifu. You, I mean, you thought you put St. Belican in there initially as a 2v2 experienced player, but instead they're not doing that. Now that Michi, Michi and Diego are having success, your other option is now St. Belican for the 1v1, who is good, but again, a little bit more predictable in terms of deck selection than the other players. Uh, you'd, you'd love to move Michi into 1v1 potentially if Pedro can't get it done, 
but you don't want to disrupt that 2v2 rhythm. Yeah, I do not envy the coach or analyst for Cream right now because their roster is making it really difficult for them to make the correct decisions. You can't break up that 2v2. It's too good. When do you sit Pedro and play Belican or Michu? And then you guys all know the pain of that now because of Fantasy Royale or Fantasy Football, Fantasy Basketball. You sit the guy the one week that he goes off or you sit the guy or play the guy the one week that he does nothing. That's the problem that Cream is in right now because of exactly what you and I are talking about. What it's supposed to be on paper and then what we're actually seeing through three weeks of gameplay. I think on the other side of it, Andrew, what we've seen, which is so frightened about Team Queso, is that even if they don't win the 2v2, they are still <sighs> so frightening in head-to-head -head play. And again, we haven't gotten to our, we haven't finished this set yet. Pedro could easily reverse sweep. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this conversation is a moot point in the end. But they are so dangerous in King of the Hill and 1v1 that if their 2v2 even gets moderately better, they are suddenly one of the most frightening teams in the league. Well, and the other thing too is their 2v2 hasn't been coming through and neither has IMJP. So you've got two pieces there that have so much potential to really kick Queso up to maybe getting that first round bye in playoffs. All right, here we go. Enough out of you and me. Let's see more out of these guys. Ruben and Pedro in this 1v1 set. Ruben, up one game. And now a bit of a waiting game in number two. It's been pretty fast and furious so far, but this time neither player wanting to move first, and it is the bar putt for Ruben. Notice how it's played pretty high here. Does not want to get punished opposite lane. Fireball cleans up those skeleton dragons. Will we be seeing royal hogs here from Pedro? Certainly possible. A lot to be told still. <laughs> First minute away, and the Venezuelan just sitting back, kind of waiting to see what his opponent does. A lot of elixir leakage, and Mega Knight out for Pedro. Yeah, Mega Knight out for Pedro. I don't know if that's exactly what he wanted to play here. Maybe the best response based off of what he had in his hand. Royal Hogs are going to be the win condition. Left-hand side, Ruben has very little. But now a 2-2 split. Fireball goes to the right, so Heal Spirit goes to the left, and a nice high Heal Spirit from Pedro to prevent a lot more damage, but Skeleton Dragons get on tower. And yeah. despite the slightly slow start, huge damage in both directions as we pass the midway point of regulation. Letting his opponent make mistakes. We see it all the time. Probably Three Musketeers the first time that it happened to each one of us at home watching where your opponent would split the pressure and then all of a sudden you defend one side, no elixir in the tank to defend the other, and then they double down their push, sell out elixir-wise, and that's why Pedro basically is sitting on a dead tower left-hand side. Yeah, it was brilliant. He knew at that point that there was no way for Pedro to really defend against the Skeleton Dragons behind those two Royal Hogs and the Heal Spirit. And so now Pedro is going to push into that lane and his Skeleton Dragons go to the wayside. And look, man, I said it because I did not like that Mega Knight coming down on the right-hand side early. It felt like too much Elixir committed to not enough Elixir spent by his opponent. And then, because hindsight is 2020, the Royal Hogs come down and there's nothing you can do about it. If that Mega Knight's still in the tank, you at least completely pacify one side. And look at the way that Pedro, or that Ruben controlled the Mega Knight in that matchup, or in that moment with the Heal Spirit and Skeletons yeah. while letting the DPS low do their job. So brilliant control, and now one fireball away here. It will take a miracle for Pedro to come back. It looks like it's going to be Ruben with a huge four and one performance on the day, a massive clutch to get the win for Team Queso. Yeah, and that has got to be an incredibly frustrating day for Cream, Real, Betis. I mean, you look at what they did. They were up three games to one when they were halfway through King of the Hill, essentially. All of a sudden, Ruben comes out, the great equalizer for Team Queso. Picks up two in King of the Hill, Kuchiku clutches, and then it's back to business for Ruben. Not even touched in this 1v1 set. Just brilliant play. Brilliant play from Ruben. And this is what he's did, he did all day, was he was one step strategy-wise ahead of his opponents. Stumbled in one game? Other than that, it's the, the, the 
understanding of both, you know, we talk about some players having great micro, some players having great macro. What makes Ruben S tier is a brilliant mastery of both. So basically split down the middle between you, myself, and the other casters. Obviously, those that pick Team Queso are going to walk away with the W here based on our predictions. And, you know, it's got to just be because of Ruben. It really is. I mean, yes, Kuchiku came out and came through in a huge moment, but these plays by Ruben in head-to-head -head are just astounding, and they're basically unparalleled at this moment. Well, Ruben has 10 wins now and three losses on the season. The next closest player is TN as TNT and Belly, both with five wins. So Ruben has just come out huge so far this season. And uh, you now you talk overall about how his importance for Team Queso. Collectively, Team Queso has got, uh, I believe, 10 wins, or sorry, 14 wins overall in games, 16 wins overall in games. 10 of those 16 wins come from Ruben. Yeah, well, you know, right now, IMJP getting a little bit of time to still figure out what he needs to do in that King of the Hill set. Benny and Coochie getting a little bit of cushion in 2v2 to still th put things together as they have, what, six more matches to come. Ruben right now just flying high. And this is the great thing is if he's going to give his team just long enough to put all that together, he doesn't have to do this every single match. As we get later on in the season, maybe he only comes out in King of the Hill because his 2v2 is playing so well and IMJP locks down two people in King of the Hill. So Team Queso looking like a threat and not a big surprise to us here at the booth. Well, respective booths. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, this is this is what you thought Team Queso could do. And let's harken back to the spring where they were so good in the No Tilt League Special Edition, won that one in dominant format and dominant performance, and then struggled in the spring. And it feels like when we, as we are looking at this longer season, more opportunity to stretch their legs and one individual match doesn't sink a season, it's going to be hard to keep Team Queso out of the playoffs and out of those top four. Yeah, so first match in the books, Team Queso... One of the first there at one and one to move to two and one. They're going to be on the top half of our standings. But next up, a couple firsts for the day. Ah, crap, making his first CRL 2020 fall debut. And Chivas Esports looking to maybe pick up their first win here in the fall. It's going to be a good one. We'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go anywhere. Coming up next, Chivas Esports and Space Station Gaming.
And here's a look at beautiful Cologne, Germany. All your pictures today of one of our major esports hubs for Clash Royale. Germany has a massive Clash Royale fan base. Of course, Big Spin is broadcasting this in German as well. So SK Gaming, we will see, of course, tomorrow. But we are worldwide. I don't care where you're watching right now. You just saw brilliance out of the Spaniard Ruben. And it feels like right now when he's oh. in form, he's the best player in the world. It does. It really does. Uh, he lives up to the hype. He did it all in the offseason. Everyone was expecting massive things with him coming into this season. And you know what? He hasn't disappointed at all. We can't expect someone to be 100%, but he's gotten pretty dang close. Now into this next matchup, another really interesting position to be in. We were just talking about Cream and them setting their 1v1 lineups as opposed to their 2v2 and King of the Hill. Now we move over to Space Station Gaming. Ah, crap, making his debut probably in position for Lapakati, even though him and RF have been perfect through their first couple matches. Is this the correct thing to do against Chivas Esports, Rich? I think you have to. I think you have to free up Lapakati so that he's able to focus on King of the Hill and you give more flexibility in King of the Hill 1v1. AC is an experienced 2v2 player. He's the second winningest 2v2 player in the West behind his teammate RF, who's pulled ahead with uh, with his little bench time. And, you know, I, I'm excited to see him in the mix. He's braggadocious, even said on Twitter a couple days yes. ago, quote, I'm so sure we 2-0 this weekend that I will deactivate my Twitter if it doesn't happen. And if you follow him, you know that uh, AC does love his Twitter. He sure does. So let's check out this big time matchup, Space Station Gaming going up against Chivas Esports. Pompeo gets the win over Igor. Huge, huge one to send this to game number five. Let's do it. It's not going to work every push, but when you force it, that's when you lose games. Very, very dominant performance from Chivas Esports. You see very happy the entire team. A make or break game for Chivas to look at the season overall. Space Station Chivas, ¿qué les puedo decir? Chivas que jugaron de tú a tú con Team Liquid, genial. El Space Station que perdió contra Trae. Esto no se lo pueden perder. ¡Qué nivel! ¡No! Imagínate, Silla. ¡Qué bien que están jugando los chicos de SSG! ¡Qué bien que están jugando! Space Station ahí, o actual campeón de CRL enfrentando Chivas. Con certeza va a dar Space. Veneni en cima de la torre. Y el TNT después de cuatro victorias seguidas. No rei da mesa, perde a primeira. You see some of Lapacati's action in that one. We'll see how he comes out. Not having to pull 2v2 duty today. A full four man squad for Space Station Gaming in this matchup against Chivas Esports. Andrew, let's take a look at Space Station. Here we go. Sam Lubasoto, their 1v1 star, now could be switched out for Lapicati. Probably won't happen, but now that is the luxury of Space Station Gaming to free that up and keep their opponents guessing. RF, AC, they're back, baby. Many, many seasons. Three years now, six seasons. These are the boys that are going to come out 2v2 for Space Station. On the other side, Chivas Esports, Adrian Piedra, Diego, Kevin, and Pompeo. This is a team that last weekend looked really good. We all said that they should come out of last weekend's loss against Team Liquid feeling like they actually gained in that matchup. Diego with one of the best games we've seen so far this season against Canario. Pompeo saying in the interim this week that he's he really thinks that the primary problem they had was deck selection. So hmm. let's see if they can correct that as they come into this weekend and get some good matchups against Space Station. Yeah, so here we go. Speaking of matchups, the band for this match is going to be Tornado coming out for both AC and RF rocking the blue. They will be our home team and Diego B and Pompeo rocking red for Chivas Esports. They'll be at the top of your screen. Tornado being out of play for both squads. Not a big surprise there. Still leaves many, many things open to be played. So let's hop into this big time game. And of course, the debut of our friend, Ah Crap. Yeah, I had to take a, take a back seat for a couple of days, but now in the mix, and you can see if you look at the backgrounds, AC and RF in the same room, just like their opponents, Diego B and Pompeo. And talking about the quality of 2v2 here, AC and RF, like I said before, the two winningest 2v2 players right now, just ahead of Razor, who is one game behind AC's 57. Diego B 
also in that top 10 of total wins at 35. Great poison value there for Space Station Gaming and exactly the type of deck choice that I want to see from these two guys coming out in their first game together. High cycle, high, high outplay capability. And here we go, second time, or actually fourth time today, seeing the Graveyard Balloon Freeze combination and Fireball trying to make some room. Let's see if they do decide to pull the freeze. No, they'll let it die, but significant damage early on for, for Chivas Esports. Yeah, a lot of great Fireball value there. Knocks that Musketeer almost out of play, slows her down, takes the Bomb Tower out of the way. A lot of damage comes in for Diego B and Pompeo. And, you know, we talk a lot about AC and RF because we've talked about them for so many years now, but Diego B and Pompeo are no slouches when it comes to this 2v2 set. This is a very, very formidable foe for Space station. Yeah, I mean, Diego B, of course, is super, super experienced overall in 2v2 over, I believe, 68 total games played wow. in the 2v2 set with a variety of partners. Pompeo, you know, a, 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 about half that amount in terms of actual gameplay, but he's, of course, one of the top balloon players in the world, so no surprise seeing that in his hand here. So... Spell value in, there it is. Fireball coming out. Was wondering what we were going to see there from Space Station. And a really nice use of those skeletons to keep that giant skeleton bomb in play. And now switching lanes is Space Station Gaming and taking their first big chunk of damage. Pressure on, and now a double bait push in the left hand and side. This is what I want to see. This is what exactly you have to do with this deck as you get into double elixir time, is you get so much on the board you start to confuse your opponents. You see all four bait cards played in about 15 seconds on the left hand oh. side. But do they have the elixir for this defense? No, they do not. Chivas Esports takes the lead in not much time for Space Station to fire back. I mean, that Royal Delivery came in and did absolutely nothing for Space Station Gaming. That balloon was raged up and on its way to the tower. No way it's going to get stopped. And just like that, AC and RF dropped their first game of the season together. And honestly, their second game of the season, period. Now, in their first match, RF and Lapo dropped the first game in reverse swept, but this is not a great way for them to start. Yeah, that was just a little bit rough. And of course, we'll go back, take a look at some of those moments in reverse. And, you know, we, we talked a lot about this, uh, this balloon, and you're seeing the coach here on both screens for Diego and Pompeo. <laughs> you see them sitting side by side. Adrian Piedra in the background enjoying himself. We've talked a lot about this balloon graveyard freeze combination, Andrew, and you see there why it can be valuable stretching your opponent thin uh, as opposed to the times we've seen it not work in the past. Yeah, and just a little bit of love I got to give out to Jose there. One of, one of my favorite personalities in the space, just always been such a good dude. And yeah, it, it, to go back to the way they're defending, I mean, look at this. Look at what they have on the right hand side. Nothing. Like, literally nothing. You're, you're asking for a fireball plus a royal delivery knockback to stop that balloon. That's not going to do what you want it to do. Where's the bomb tower? Where's the dark goblin? Where is the elixir conservation? I understand keeping up the pressure and making your opponent make mistakes with this bait deck. They only had log and snowball. It felt like they had so much more based off of the lack of pressure put up by Space Station. Well, you talk about the, I mean, I mentioned the all four bait cards played in the left-hand lane yeah. in, a, in, a, in about 15 seconds. Well, that's 12 Elixir played in the left-hand lane in about 15 seconds. A lot, a lot of pressure, and that's just from those four bait cards played. So you see them thirsting on the right-hand side, maybe not having the correct pieces. Maybe some of that was to get certain cards back in cycle while creating pressure. Didn't pay off in this case. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that we've seen this deck succeed by doing with Morton and Sam specifically is creating those mistakes early on. So you start aggressive with your bait cards to see how they want to play their spells and where they're sitting in their cycle. And then based off of your first push there with your barrels, then you start to switch things up. Then you start to play things when they're out of cycle. Then you turn up the heat in one lane and in the other. But like you said, you can't play all four of your bait cards in one lane and then expect to defend in the right. It's just too easy for your opponent to cheaply defend.
Well, they had the one billion. They had the bomb tower. And once the bomb tower is not available, how do you defend that balloon push? Mm -hmm. What do you do, right? They didn't have a lot of ways to deal with knocking it back. Uh, They have the fireball, but they didn't have a lot of ways to control the balloon on top of that. So a tough situation there for Space Station Gaming. They fall in the first game. Let's go ahead and jump into game number two and see if Diego B and Pompeo can continue with the same level of success. Yeah, and you saw, you know, another one of those interactions with that royal delivery being dropped down but just didn't do anything to that balloon and Diego B and Pompeo going all right you guys want to do that we can do it too I, it did get some damage here Andrew I I, I am gonna say I find that find the opening maybe a bit cheesy to go throw with the the split all four to open up but in the end it did work relatively well so gg to chivas in that opening moment yeah you know they're only down by a couple of elixir they have to eat some damage there to even things up from that fisherman um but the one thing they did do is get those both of those cards back in cycle so they could start to create pressure again so now we see that musketeer in the back but we see it with a you know skeleton barrel up front and then in the opposite lane a goblin skelly barrel push We'll, we'll have to find out and you see the Valkyrie here, and you understand why ACRF do play a lot of Graveyard. So Valkyrie does give them some value if that does come out. And that's kind of what I'm talking about there. You see a little bit of push on the right-hand side with the Skeleton Barrel, baits out the Musketeer, gets some poison damage in, another barrel down. They are playing this the way that AC and RF should have played it in game number one. Second barrel in. There should be a log and cycle. There you go. Takes care of business. 90 seconds away. And Chivas Esports out to a pretty commanding lead in 2v2. And this is, this is again, I mean, I know I'm saying it over and over, but this is what you're supposed to do. That barrel coming in to support the Dark Goblin that played cleanup on defense. It's barrel after barrel after barrel after barrel, and they never stop. There it is. Once again, they've gone through all four. Skeletons come around to try to pick up the damage from the Skeletons as they pop, but 10-17 on the right-hand side. Currently, it is AC and RF way on their back foot. And a nice slow there coming in. Going to help them get a stab. Heal Spirit just for a chip. Yeah, I think maybe they thought that either Skeletons would come out to play some defense or maybe pushing some Skeleton Dragons away. Snowball still does get a little extra value there, but wow. not exactly the, pr the prediction they were hoping for. <laughs> Talking about value, I mean, that's Poison Fireball value to a T. Now the balloon finally comes down with Graveyard. So it's AC and RF going with the Graveyard Balloon Freeze, and this is a big one. Balloon in, freeze down, Graveyard gets a significant chunk of damage, and that Balloon Death Bomb does help out, but what do they have to stop this bait push? Yeah, you know, a really, really nice offensive push there from the boys for state Space Station, but great defense. Dark Goblin way back behind. Musketeer up high, building in. They are a little bit ahead on Elixir. This time, Skeletons will get at the Skeleton Barrel. Space Station gaming with a well-timed freeze. This balloon, can it get there? The snowball makes some room, oh! does not get the connection. And now it's just a spell cycle game. We just need a snowball, fire, excuse me, fireball, poison log. Where is it right now? Chivas trying to get out alive. Graveyard in, can a fireball freeze? Get this log one done in. for Space Station. Two, They're one. trying 183 Whoa. HP. Diego B and Pompeo take the 2v2 win. By the skin of their teeth, my friend. Oh my goodness. SSG firing back late, but Aukrap and RF losing their first match together. Space Station dropping their first 2v2 set. And AC to start his 2020 fall career at 0 and 2. Yeah, 0 and 2 definitely. Maybe, you know, you talk about not wanting a uh, to, to, to see AC and RF stumble in this situation, and this may be the worst kind of stumble, right? Yeah. It did look like they weren't in rhythm. It's not just about the loss overall, but just they didn't quite have the same flow you're used to seeing them have. Yeah, it's it, it really was. It really did feel like they were out of rhythm. And, and you know, I think the best way to kind of look at that from a macro or like take a step back, eagle eye view, is just look at the interactions coming out from Diego B and Pompeo in game two, and then look at the interactions coming out from uh, from Aukrap and RF in game one. They're radically different in how they play their bait. 
And taking a look at these final moments here, AC and RF trying to get back in it, but you see how low they are on Elixir and just not able to, even with the sellout, beat the spell cycle. So AC and RF take the bagel in their opening set of the fall split together, and we head into a King of the Hill where you do have to think that Space Station Gaming, I mean, yes, they have the advantage, RF, Lapo, and Samuel Bosoto as their one, two, three, but Chivas now has a set to give to take this win. Yeah, a big, big opening set there for Chivas because doing it in two feels like the best way for them right now. Having Pompeo and Diego out of play for that 1v1 set, we saw the way that Kevin R.A. came out last week. I don't want to give him too much. Uh, I don't want to critique it too much. He's still very new. He's still, you know, very young to the league. But that just isn't the position you want to be in if you're Chivas Esports. And Adrian Piedra, he's been kind of hit and miss. It honestly feels like their best head-to-head -head guys are in their 2v2 set. But they need to win 2v2. And they just had a huge 2v2 win over one of the best duos, period, in the history of CRL. Yeah, I mean, this significantly changes the math. If Chivas Esports loses the 2v2, they have almost assuredly lost the match overall. Very hard for them to go through Space Station for a reverse sweep. But in this case now, I don't know. This gets kind of this gets kind of uh, close. I would say that maybe I give this 55-45 overall to Chivas Esports with how many games they have to lose at this stage. Yeah, and, and we talk about tough positions to be in. Ah, crap having a really, really rough 2v2 set after watching his teammates in Lapakati and the God RF playing so well. I know you don't walk away from it. I know Trainer Luis doesn't want to switch him out, but the numbers don't lie. And him and Lapakati played very, very well together. Yeah, you got to wonder how much of it is, again, we talk about rhythm. You know AC and RF have been playing 2v2 together, but you also know so much effort was put into getting Lapo and RF spun up and ready to play those first two weeks to make sure they had that locked down. So I'm wondering, I, you know, I don't think it's time to pull the ripcord on an AC yet, mm -hmm. especially if they end up pulling out the win today. We will definitely see at least one, if not two more weeks of AC and RF, no matter what happens. Yeah, I, I agree. They just 2 0 tried. Lapo and RF. Just just to throw that in the mix. Yeah. Just want to say that. Fair enough. Here we go. RF, Samuel Basoto, and Lapacati, the exact lineup we would expect, pretty much in the order we'd expect. Pompeo going to lead things off. Adrian Piedra in that second spot. And Diego B going to close things out for Chivas Esports and King of the Hill. Let's go ahead, jump on into it. Pompeo, top of your screen. The God RF at the bottom and in King of the Hill. RF, lifetime win rate might surprise you. 49% with two King of the Hill sweeps. Yeah, a little lower than I think anyone would guess. Well, a lot of that is uh, going to that fall split of last year where he went 6 and 10 in the fall, and Immortals back then just wasn't quite in rhythm in the fall of 2019. So already Pompeo's fed his opponent a decent amount of elixir with two small misplays, early plays on both the Bar Barrel and the Heal Spirit. Fisherman won't do a whole lot here, but RF now going to put the pressure on right at the bridge, and the Heal Spirit will keep that Lumberjack chop, chop, chop yeah. at the Royal Giant. This should be a lot for RF. That is a beautiful recognition by RF. He knew exactly what his opponent was going to play. Lumberjack going to cruise on through the tower. Balloon drops in. Tower down early on. Easy dubs for Space Station Gaming. We'll see how much RF chooses to continue pressure here or just play some defense. Has the Fisherman and the Lumberjack both very solid defensive options. And assuming he is playing the six man here, and there you go, the 3-3 three, three split. Yeah, I mean, the decision making there by Pompeo, he kind of dug his own grave. Like I said, two small misplays with the Heal Spirit and that Bar Barrel not getting what he wanted out of them. One, to extend the life of his own Musketeer, and two, to support a counter push. Then... By those cards showing, RF already knows what his win condition is, and instead of kind of backing off after those mistakes, Pompeo decided to sell out and double down on him. And Pompeo forced to play a lot of defense here. You can see with the troops on the board, even though there's even Elixir in the hands, that was positive Elixir overall for RF. And now he goes Musketeer to the right, and Pompeo gonna go hard on the left-hand side now. Yeah, not a bad decision there by Pompeo. He sees the great DPS card being cycled to the right, so he decides to go in on the left, but it's just not gonna be enough at this point. And now two Muskies on the board for the God RF, trying to set up for one more push in the left-hand lane is Pompeo, but 
going to have to get some real fancy footwork to break through here against the Lumberjack Fisherman. And of course, all the heavy single target damage. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Fancy footwork, because he's going to be able to cycle back to that Fisherman very, very quickly. And since the Fisherman's already on the board, if Pompeo doesn't want to play his Royal Giant, it's going to break up the way he likes to orchestrate his pushes. So RF making all the right moves and making his opponent make mistakes. Very easy game number one here for Space Station in a set that we both really favor them in. Yeah, I mean, this is big. Game number one in. And so now you have to still beat. You see, only have two lives left to be RF Lapo and Samuel. So every single one of these games that gets lost in King of the Hill, you start to swing that 55-45 I said for Chivas beforehand. Now I switch it around. I'm going to say it's 55-45 the opposite direction with RF winning game number one. Yeah, it's crazy that big of a swing, right? Just based off of one guy going down. But that's, again, that speaks to the strength and the depth of this roster from Space Station. So you see right here, this is the moment where RF sees what he's going to do and he calls his bluff. Doubles down, balloon up. Heal Spirit in to help this Lumberjack out. And at this point, everyone knows that there's nothing to stop that Lumberjack. Yes, the Baby Dragon comes out, but that Baby Dragon coming out also lets you know that that's the last thing he has in response. And a Baby Dragon is not gonna stop a Lumberjack or a Balloon, let alone both of them together. That's why Royal Giant and Single Elixir is always such a risk, mm -hmm. right? It's six slow moving Elixir and playing the Royal Giant down on Elixir at that moment in single, really just a, a bit of an overcommitment there for Pompeo and he paid for it. Yeah, you know, I learned that the tough way with Ram Rider. Ram Rider is one of those cards because it has so many great defensive capabilities. You think, look, I can defend, slow down, and in turn go on offense. But if you defend three Elixir with five early on and you go on offense and you get nothing out of it, that's a big swing in your opponent's favor. So you make that even larger with something like a Royal Giant that doesn't even provide any defensive utility, you are in a lot of trouble. And especially if you're playing against the best in the world, they're going to know you're in trouble and they're going to capitalize on it. Yeah, so big time win here for RF, getting it back in motion after a rough 2v2 outing. Yeah. Coming up next, it's going to be uh, an interesting one here for Chivas Esports. They have... Adrian Piedra, and then of course Diego B as the last player, and Adrian has always been better in the 1v1 set than in King of the Hill. Yeah, Adrian Piedra, a guy that I've been saying is kind of a coin toss for the last couple seasons because we see so much promise and potential, and then we see some big misplays and moments of maybe mental slip-ups. So which Adrian will we see today? Is it the seasoned vet that is, you know, a superstar for a reason, or will it be what we've seen a lot of the last couple seasons? Well, Andrew, when I talk about that difference in terms of skill in 1v1 versus King of the Hill for Adrian Piedra, there is a 20% difference in win rates. Wow. 58% win rate in 1v1, 38 in King of the Hill. Yeah, let's just let's just round up there and call it 60 and 40. And a 60% win rate in 1v1 is is that's amazing. And a 40% win rate in King of the Hill is a real, real issue. <laughs> yeah, so it's, exactly. It's it's a it's a big swing there. And that's why, you know, you talk about Adrian Piedra, who, who struggled in those King of the Hill moments, but then you look at his overall 1v1 gameplay, including the great run he put on during the No-Tilt World Championship this season. That's what he can do in those best of threes. So here we go, another example of using that Royal Giant early on. Musketeer's already cycled to the right, and so RF has to play the Royal Giant in front of the Musketeer to protect his Musketeer. You see, though, what is he doing? Heal Spirit to keep the Musketeer alive. Skeletons to keep the Musketeer alive. A lot of preservation on his DPS. Yeah, keeping her alive for a long time. Fireball cleans up most of that, but Ooh. the Minor Bats push gonna do a ton here. Adrian Piedra might get towered down here, or at least very close, good Heal Spirit. And now we're pretty much even after all that action in the opening minute and a half. Yeah, great, great blows thrown by both gentlemen here on the board. I mean, RF with a really, really strong RG push in, and he defends his Musketeer to prevent I probably a tower down. But Adrian Piedra, what great recognition of when things were going to go down and when to support that push with his Miner. Lava Hound into that right-hand lane one more time. Night Witch way in the back, and you see Adrian just taking his hands off the phone, sitting back, stretching, relaxing for a moment, knows it's going to be a few seconds before he has to get back in business. So flying machine behind, starting to feel a lot more like clone, lava clone with Miner here. 
Skeleton Dragons, Heal Spirit, and Fireball are going to provide a little bit of help there. That was an interesting flying machine. Do you understand why he was putting it back there to spread out and make the Fireball go away from the rest of that push? But Adrian put it in range of the Princess Tower as well, so gives some extra value to that Fireball that maybe he didn't intend while trying to prevent too much value. Yeah, so this becomes a very peculiar situation to be in. Will this be a two-tower or a one-tower game? And I think RF is going to decide that right now. Fireball clean up one more time. Skeleton Dragons right behind. Heal Spirit trying to get down and help. A second Musketeer in, but Miner, no, does not go to the second Musketeer. Instead goes to Tower. This is going to be a Ooh. lie here. 414 to 440. We are not going to be in a two-tower game, folks. This is going to go to sudden death overtime next tower falls gg well played oh man this is such an incredibly close game you can see rf all the way bent over here going on offense with that royal giant a lot of damage gonna need to come in here for pay uh adrian can he do it fireball comes in and that's gonna do it rf two up two down Great performance so far in King of the Hill. Yeah, this just throws, shows you the threat of the god RF. He starts 0-2 on the day, turns around, bounces back 2-0 here in King of the Hill. One of the things we've talked about with RF is his mental fortitude. One of the reasons why he's always put in those top, top pressure, high pressure situations. And you know what? Coming through once again is the young man from Arizona. Yeah, Adrian's woes in King of the Hill continue. Just has not been his set dropping his, rate, his win rate down to 37% now. So a 21% difference in his 1v1 versus King of the Hill win rates. And RF making up for those people who watched him in 2v2 and didn't get a single crown. Well, he says, don't worry, guys. Uh, he, made a, he made a prediction he would get 10 crowns this weekend and working to pay off that promise. Look at this brilliant defense from RF. He cycles that fireball early on to clear off the flying machine from the board. He gets back around again here to help that musketeer clean up the stuff on the tower, barely keeping his princess tower alive. And he did a lot of that in this game where he would make excellent decisions when defending. And we talk a lot about layers, offensive layers. Playing against Lava Hound is the definition of that because you've got to deal with things behind the Lava Hound supporting it, things like the Flying Machine, and of course that Miner when it comes in, the Lava Pups popping. RF had all of those things in sequence every single time, and that's the only reason he kept that tower alive. He barely squeaked by. Yeah, I really thought that Miner was going to go to the second Musketeer rather than the first, yeah. and doesn't end up doing that. You ought to wonder if maybe there's a bit of a difference in the outcome if that miner does go to that second played musketeer and help get her off the board. But that didn't happen. And here we are with the God RF potentially putting up yet another King of the Hill sweep joins the five win club in King of the Hill so far this season. And on the precipice of not only his third King of the Hill sweep in his career, but potentially his second of the season. Yeah, I mean, dual threat to a T. And the other thing about that Miner coming in the Musketeer was, it was a will they, won't they? Because that Musketeer came down at the same time basically as the Miner, but for Adrian, he's thinking about keeping my Miner alive to get more damage from the Pups. So yes, definitely should have gone to the Musketeer, keeps it off the board, keeps the Miner alive, tanks for the Pups, but just not in the cars for Adrian. Here we go, game number three, King of the Hill RF, with a chance to sweep up against Diego B who with a win over RF would even up his King of the Hill career at 15 and 15. Diego looking like it might be Royal Giant here. And Diego B coming off of a great last match where him and Pompeo took down Razor and Canario in that 2v2 set. And then once again, took down Canario in King of the Hill, but just not able to take down Igor. It feels like Graveyard for RF, which wouldn't be surprising, of course. Question is if Diego B is playing, yeah, so is he playing the Lightning version here? And if he is, that Musketeer we saw earlier could be in a lot of trouble. Really nice heal spirit there, gets that Royal Giant one more shot in. Had it been dropped a second earlier, might have got two. A heal spirit in return with a Brawler and Skeleton Dragons is gonna give RF a nice lead. Yeah, look at that. Little extra shots on the left-hand side. 1474 remains as a minute 15 has ticked away. RF going to pick up this Musketeer. There you go. Night high. 
an immediate graveyard. The fisherman gonna pull that out of tank range for that princess. Princess gonna reset on top of those skeletons, but damage done. Yeah, just pulled it a half step too late, and those two princess shots to the knight give enough room for the skeletons to begin to stack, and that's the result. 670 on the left hand. Line. Yeah, just the two shots in the beginning. That's a great thing you point out, which is why we see so much naked graveyard plus snowball. Just leaving a two or three skeletons on the board to tank for the other ones is so brutal. Royal Giant will get one shot. 2026 on the left hand side as we go into double elixir time. The God RF with a lot on the board and the elixir lead. Yeah, as we get double or deeper into double and triple elixir time, I feel like RF is going to have to maybe do a slightly better job with his barb barrel because that heal spirit does feel like the only thing that could steal the game from him. Now the heal spirit out of cycle and in turn out of cycle for the rest of the game. Not going to be there to catch that royal giant coming across the river. So Diego B has to reset his offensive push. Poison in on the left hand side and RF choosing to instead go with the poison cycle look as opposed to pulling a graveyard there. We'll see if that comes back to bite him here. 59 HP on the left hand side and now Diego B getting ready for a big time push. Heal Spirit not down in time. Just a beautiful, beautiful play by the god RF to make it so that Diego B could not get the heal spirit with his royal giant and all it was was because of a little bit of offensive pressure that baited out that heal spirit RF promised you 10 crowns this weekend <laughs> didn't deliver in the 2v2 says hey don't worry guys I got this king of the hill one, two, three, the first player to have two sweeps on the season and did it in absolute style. What an interesting position for Lapakati to be in. And, and we'll find out if in the future this is going to be a good spot. But I've talked a lot about how Lapo is an emotional player. He rides high. When he's doing well, you do not want to play against him. And Lapakati, up until now, has been doing very, very well this season. But now he's not even going to show his head in this match. I don't think he will. After dominating in 2v2, doing great job in King of the Hill, he's now going to be benched for the whole day because I can't imagine he comes out over Samuel Basoto. So in the future, when they meet a little bit more adversity, what Lapo will we see? I don't know. Right now, they're feeling pretty good, though. You know, in the end, look, how do you get it done? I don't. I think that one of the things that has made this team succeed is a lack of ego amongst players, right? They don't care who comes out where. Yeah. They care about getting the win. And that's been a big, big benefit to Space Station Gaming overall. And I think that well, that's, uh, that's a credit to Trainer Luis and helping cultivate a culture that supports that a lot. So my suspicion here is that Lapo's not worried that he's just going, yeah, let's go ahead, win, and get that money. Yeah, all about getting those dubs. So Space Station Gaming going into that third and final set after an incredible performance by the God RF in King of the Hill. Chivas Esports now put in a very difficult position. Who comes out against Samuel Basoto, the latter god himself? Will it be Kevin R.A. or will it be Adrian Piedra? Do you truly think there's a better choice to make here? Man, that's so tough. Kevin has a high upside, but nerves. Nerves are an issue, and we didn't really see him at his best last time out. Adrian, I think, is the right call here. He's really experienced. And he's been playing well in best of three sets overall. Remember, he's he's done so well during this offseason. And I, again, King of the Hill below, uh, uh, King of the Hill to 1v1, a 20, 20%, now 21% win rate difference. I think you put the Aztec Eagle out there and let him fly. I, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. I think nerves is too much against Kevin R.A. here. And I also think if you're going up against a guy like Samuel Basoto, who I know is furious, that guy is so mad for how he threw that game last week that he's going to come out and probably dominate whoever he wants to run or we want to dominate whoever he runs into this 1v1 set. That graveyard misplay from him cost them the match, and that is not a thing that he does regularly. So I know he's going to come out angry and ready to go today, and I think Adrian matches up better against that version of Samuel Basoto. That, you know, you do raise an interesting question, though, is with that sort of mistake, does Samuel take a break here and you put out Lapakati, who is who's so far playing very, very calm? Yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question here. So we'll see in a, in a few moments whether it's going to be Samuel or Lapo coming out, whether it will be Adrian Piedra 
or the rookie Kevin for Chivas Esports. Yeah, and if it is eight, what does that mean for Kevin R.A.'s career for the rest of the season? And while we're waiting for those lineups to come in, remember to check out Break Time Battles today on Stats Royale when we are done. The battles will take place from Wednesday till Wednesday. You saw our boy John there going to go up against a CRL pro for putting up an outstanding performance over those seven days. And also I saw on Twitter during the break a couple people shouting us out, being happy to hear their names and see their names, saying they finally made it to the CRL. RL broadcast. So go check out Break Time Battles. It's the best way for you to be a part of this show and the best way for you to maybe play a pro right here on CRL West. So I don't think I'll ever be on a Break Time Battle. I'll just take what I can get here. Um, I think I think people see enough of us here on the broadcast and to see us play <laughs> as well. It's talking about gameplay. Samuels, they're going with that for Space Station. And like I said, Adrian Piedra, I think this is the right call here by Jose VTS to send out Adrian for this third and final set. Yeah, I love it. Here we go. 1v1, Samuel Basoto looking for redemption. Adrian Piedra trying to bring home that first W for Chivas Esports. A lot of those big time numbers for Adrian in 1v1 came in the CRL fall season of 2018 with Complexity, where he went eight and six in sets overall, 21 and 15. Since then, he's an even four and four in 1v1 games. Strike that, two and two in 1v1 games. So Samuel giving us a different look than what we've seen from basically everyone. We haven't seen a lot of Bandit here in 2020 at all. We haven't seen a lot of cards that work into Bandit's, uh, I guess, archetype. Yeah, very curious. And look at this, the Minor Loon push on the right-hand side. Ram Rider trying to hold on, but mm. she's focused for the moment on the Miner. Well, the, how much tankage can the Miner get? Enough for one big-time balloon connection. And a second drop does sneak on in for Adrian. Wow, but look at that. Bandit down with the heal spirit after the Ram Rider connection. Hunter does come in to help stop the bleeding, but Samuel does fire right back. Oh, And he's wow. just putting the pressure on right now, and that's going to be a tower down on the right-hand side. Adrian Piedra, no, a nice miner to push the Lumberjack off and save tower for the moment. Yeah, but Samuel not going to stop keeping up the heat here, recognizing where his opponent's at elixir-wise. 382 to 666, the sign of the beast, if you will. Six elixir to five. Yeah, and a two, yeah that two elixir or one and a half elixir advantage right now for Samuel. Very, very well played, and Adrian got very aggressive, got some big damage, but Samuel recognizing the opportunity, took the, take the advantage, and here we are with the lead going into the double elixir time. The Ram Rider down to meet that giant skeleton. Heal Spirit gonna help with those skellies every single time. I doubt Adrian plays them again in response. And the giant skeleton survives with decent HP, so this is big for Adrian Piedra. Has a good chance to sneak a balloon through here get some death damage at minimum, and the Ram Rider does fall. How close will the balloon Ooh. get death damage in? And we are very close as we are 30 seconds away from sudden death. Yeah, nice Ram Rider plays, but Adrian still getting that damage in. Miner a half second late to distract that Musketeer, so Musketeer to do double duty on that Hunter as well as the Miner, and back on offense goes the Space Station Gaming rep. Snowball does not push the Ram Rider back. That's going to be tower down. Samuel with a huge lead just has to get one pick up here. Miner trying to do its work. Fireball cleans things up. And Samuel Basoto takes game number one of the 1v1. What a devastating loss there for Adrian Pedro. 132 HP remaining. A opening onslaught that Sam could not keep up with. But Sam did the exact thing you need to do with those cards in your deck. Recognize the elixir lead that you have, the elixir lead that you have, excuse me, and turn it up. They call it bridge spam for a reason. Well, this was a lot of bridge spamming, even though it wasn't a bridge spam deck. Yeah, I mean, you know, you bet whether it's Battle Ram or Ram Rider, both of them do benefit from pressure at the bridge, and that's a big part of the bandit, is the ability to play a little bit of defense, but really put pressure on the opposite side. and. You see Samuel Basoto taking game number one here. Adrian really has to look at that that opening exchange where it felt like he got a ton out of it and uh, maybe regroup a little bit in terms of having just a tad bit more elixir for defense. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's going to be something where he's going to have to go back, look at the game tape, and we're going to do it right now, actually. Miner into the tower on top of the Ram Rider. Great spot for the Miner to go to because that Ram Rider is having a hard time slowing down the balloon. 
and it gets damage on the Ram Rider. Balloon is in, but here you see three Elixir in the hand of Adrian and just too much to deal with. I mean, maybe it's not playing the Hunter so low so that the Heal Spirit doesn't get on top of the Bandit, but I don't know, man. Sam made it really difficult for him to make the correct decision. Yeah, I mean, he sent the Minor Loon in at that point. He sent in eight Elixir when he was already behind a little bit in terms of the, the, those giant, those skeleton dragons being taken care of when they split high. So kind of playing from behind there, Adrian maybe putting the pedal to the metal a bit early in this matchup. Yeah, and then I'm wondering if in return, after he got such a massive opening, if he should have done only minor chip damage to the tower, save the rest of what he had for defense, or even maybe tried to turn up the heat a little bit on the opposite lane. Because you saw Samuel was forced to use his Ram Rider regularly for defending the balloon. That also being one of his biggest offensive threats, maybe there's a way to kind of break up the pushes that he kept putting down because Adrian just couldn't do it. And we saw, again, how difficult it was for Sam to defend that balloon. Yeah, and then you, the other end of it, you see the snowball not stopping the Ram Rider. Yeah. So you talk about getting the Ram Rider out of play in some way, not giving it value on both ends of the board. Well, you gave it defensive value and then gave it offensive value without putting together the correct defense on that side. So Samuel with the win and a chance to close things out in the reverse sweep for Space Station Gaming. So it looks like, barring a, uh, a, br a brilliant performance here from Adrian Piedra, AC might s escape this one without uh, being blamed too much for that 2v2 situation. Now, I do got to ask, does he have to deactivate his Twitter no matter what, though? Because he said 2-0, I'm pretty sure. So uh, probably going to be a, a week or so till we see the Space Station Gaming representative back hanging out, huh? Well, I don't know if he's saying 2-0 for the matches overall for the weekend. Okay. And that's my guess is that he'll say it was 2-0 for the matches, <laughs> assuming they win today. So we'll see uh, what Ah Crap's able to, able to do. And again, we get another look at this team tomorrow. You can't really judge a duo off of one matchup. Yeah. Maybe AC and RF weren't totally in rhythm, but we'll see them again tomorrow. And my suspicion is that they will be a lot more fluid in that one. But right now, still business to be taken care of. Game number two of 1v1, Adrian Piedra trying to save this one for Chivas Esports and maybe save their season in a way. Uh, yeah, in a big way. That's actually a really strong point you make. I mean, if you are going to start your season off the way that Chivas has, picking up nothing but L's, there's, I, I think this far into it, three weeks in, that's when you really start to hit the panic button. So Sparky for Adrian Piedra, and it will be Goblin Giant Sparky. We've seen a lot more Giant Sparky so far this season Uh oh. in CRL. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. That's a lot nice of value minor. given away. Oh, and man. And Sparky gets a huge shot on the right-hand side. Does not get a second. Does not matter. 623 remains. Adrian Piedra comes out swinging heavy in game number two. A beautiful fireball thrown by Adrian Piedra that soaks up those Spear Goblins, the Bomb Tower, and, of course, damage on the Princess. Doesn't get much better than that when you talk about value. And just going to eat those wall breakers, right? He can afford to do that one time. Yep, he can't. Totally can afford. Maybe can afford to do it twice, but can't afford to do it more than 100%, that. 100%, because also once this tower goes down on the right-hand side, then he's going to be going back into his weaker tower. So Adrian kind of putting himself in a position to succeed down the line. Goblin Giant to pick up the Musketeer aggro, and then you see a bit of a split there with the Skeleton Dragons, and... We'll see. Can he control oh. a nice zap out of Adrian Piedra? Tower down. Very, very well played by Adrian. An excellent zap, man. That is about as good as it gets. I definitely think he should have spent a little bit more there on defense, and you can see that he's frustrated by that wall breaker connecting. But with a minute left to play and wall breakers really succeeding as a deck that goes into the opposite lane, or at least not right into their opponent's pressure, this is going to be a very, very tough minute for Samuel Basoto. 14, 15 left-hand lane, and he puts all that on the right-hand side. That is free Sparky yeah. damage, and that's going to be a GG, it looks like, here in game number and two. And an excellent heal spirit behind to just make sure that knight was close enough to the Musketeer, to both of them, eat up that Sparky damage, take him off the board, and that's exactly what I was talking about. You never want to have to play into a Sparky because it just gets so much value. Wallbreakers trying to sneak on by, and they might. One does connect for 62. Might we see some minor fireball play on the left-hand side, but might that also be a little bit too late? Yeah, I mean, 
641 on the king. A thousand left on the princess. It's just all bad here for Samuel. Adrian oh, Pietro, he's gonna do it. Our next three crown of the day. <laughs> you see him there praying for it. Hands together, he even goes, please. And yes, sir, your wishes are granted. Three crowns for Adrian Piedra and a massive, massive win for Chivas Esports. Yeah, that's absolutely huge. And this is, again, this is where Adrian's good. Adrian's good in a best of three. You gotta beat him twice. It's not easy to do. He's super, super experienced. And now uh, maybe some nervousness on the side of SSG and Samuel Basoto. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. This is one of those matches that if SSG walks away from with a loss, they are going to look back and just beat themselves up for the decision making. Now, you always put AC and RF together. I get it. But it's just one of those things that's really tough if you end up dropping this third and final set, which gives Chivas a match. And this is not the initial push that did all the huge damage, but it's a good one nonetheless. You see the Goblin Giant come down to distract. Oh yeah, this is that beautiful zap yeah. that's gonna get that last shot in from the Spartan. Yeah, you talk about timing, that's about as good as it gets in regards to timing. Sliver of HP, no problem. Sparky shot coming in, tower going down. A Little bit of defensive lapse here from Adrian just based off the elixir he had in hand, but was not a problem as you saw here. Goes in and closes things out with the three crown. Yeah, the Musketeer multiple times just, you saw two times where he, where he gets in trouble. One was that nice zap play out of Adrian that really did seal the match. The other one was you saw seven Elixir being spent in the right-hand lane, trying to maybe spread his opponent thin with Samuel Basoto, but brilliant play to counter that, get it off the board, and leave another healthy Sparky. And now we go to game number three, and it is Chivas Esports coach Jose VTS calling a timeout to maybe talk decks over a bit as they go into game number three. Yeah, taking the time out to ensure victory here for Chivas as this is so important for them. And then just to let you guys know at home, you fans of Samuel Basoto, we had our Brazilian casters asking, he just is not able to have his face cam right now due to a bad internet, connect internet connection at home. He's opting to take his face off the screen to make sure to put better gameplay on the screen. So hopefully in the future, we might have that repaired. But just in case you were wondering why we're not seeing his pretty face, that is the reason. Back to the match, 0-0. Zero, zero. Chivas Esports looking to pick up their first win of the season. This is so important for Chivas to get the win, but also this is a big time loss for Space Station Gaming who looked like they were gonna be in our top three, definitely in our top five, losing to a team that hasn't yet found victory. I don't know, man. I, I just don't know what you do moving forward if that is what happens. I mean, you regroup and come back out tomorrow and come out and guarantee yourself that win tomorrow, right? This is a big time weekend. A 1-1 split wouldn't be disastrous. 2-0 would be great. They cannot afford to lose tomorrow if they do lose today. And I have to imagine right now that even though Chivas Esports is facing a best of one to decide whether they go 1-2 or 0-3 to start the season, I feel like there's more pressure on Samuel in this final game than there is on AJ. I, I, I completely agree with you. And speaking of pressure, it's really interesting going into the weekend period when you talk about the teams that are facing off against Space Station Gaming. Today we have Chivas at 0-3, tomorrow they have Misfits at 0-3. But what does that mean? On paper, you look at it and you go, easy money, right? Well, not exactly, because those teams that are down 0-3, they're playing with nothing to lose, as you're talking about, especially in a situation like this when we're in regards to pressure, but also, as we talk about a lot, that chip on their shoulder. They're angry. They feel like they are, they've are they been done wrong by the game. They've been done wrong by Clash Royale, and that's not always a team you want to run into, even if they haven't performed well throughout the season. Well, I think Chivas is the more frightening of those two matchups, right? We saw how good they were against Liquid last weekend, and we're seeing how good they've been in moments here today, taking it all the way down to the final game of 1v1. Misfits, we'll talk about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think they're a different story. I think Misfits is in, is in disarray right now, whereas Chivas came into this weekend feeling like they were capable of winning any match. Yeah, that's very, very true. So any wet match to win, this is the one to do it. Adrian Piedra, Samuel Basoto. Game number three. Adrian taking a big breath here. He's been in these situations plenty of times before, all the way back to two-time back-to-back second places in CCGS Latin America, and of course making the top eight in the CCGS World Finals. So lots of experience playing with an audience, not to mention now in his fifth season 
of CRL in the West. And a bit of a nod there coming out from Agent Piedra, recognizing what he's going up against. And a Sparky again. But look at that Magic Archer value on the right. Yeah. Magic Archer with a ton of geometry. So you're thinking about that left-hand side where the Sparky comes out. Magic Archer taking a look at that Mega Minion and just running wild on the right-hand side. 12.03 remains. Yeah, a little bit of trouble there for Adrian because of the amount of damage he allowed to come in on both sides as well going up against Royal Hog. So Mega Minion going to come right on through. A nice zap again from Adrian, but not quite as good as the one we saw in that last game. Yeah, the heal spirit was solid out of Samuel to distract the Sparky on the front end. And then you had, of course, the cannon cart on the back end. So right now it is Adrian Piedra with the lead overall 10-18 in that left-hand lane. But nice dual lane pressure here from Sam. Yeah, and this is trouble for Adrian because, you know, we saw him sacrifice damage a couple times last game. How is he going to do that now going up against a deck that creates such great dual lane pressure? How do you really sell out on that Sparky Goblin Giant push without sacrificing the opposite lane? And you're seeing the one weird part about this deck from Samuel, the one maybe frustrating part, is that it does have a slight cycle problem where sometimes you'll get caught without a great choice of what to cycle in the back when you're sitting at 10 Elixir. And you saw that Magic Archer just kind of get fed to the right-hand side. Yeah, that's a really that's a really great thing you point out just because it is such an expensive deck with only having two cards below three Elixir in hand. I mean, the Fisherman, I guess, is the best response. Look at that cannon card <laughs> hot on the left-hand oh, side. Samuel putting a lot down, but now there is a Goblin Giant with a Mega Minion in front on the left-hand lane. Fireball making some room. Goblin Giant should get two hits here before the Fisherman takes it. Nice zap out of Adrian. Yeah, huge zap there from Adrian, but is it going to be enough? No, sir, it's not. Royal Recruits take that right-hand tower. 20 seconds to take both. And just like that, Samuel Basoto going to bring things home for his squad. Yeah, big, big win for Samuel. Rough spot there for Adrian Piedra. Could not handle the dual lane pressure. And a lot of that was the Magic Archer doing a ton on the early side with that damage in the right hand lane. Spread Adrian thin. GG well played. And... That's a huge win here for Space Station. Yeah, and you can see the look on Adrian's face, just complete and utter loss because, you know, Chivas Esports has shown so much. They did it last week and we said it, they should be proud coming into the match today. It's the same thing again today where they should be proud going into their next match. But how many times can that happen before it's just not enough? How many times can we say, you know what, they did a really great job today, they need to regroup, come out again with what we saw, and then take that next match? We can maybe say that one or two more times maximum for Chi Sports. This is a brutal, devastating loss for that squad. Yeah, this, this one hurts. I mean, I would say that last weekend maybe hurts even more. Uh, it felt like they really had a good chance to put away uh, Team Liquid and then Surgical Goblin clutching things up and King of the Hill setting up Igor. This one puts them 0-3, but keep this in mind that they've gotten through one of the hardest parts of the uh, of the overall lineup, right? Tribe, Team Liquid, and then, of course, now Space Station Gaming. So yeah. they look good going into the middle part of the season, and their, their matchups will get easier as time goes on. But they would love to go in with one more, with, with at least one match win. Couldn't get it done. Yeah, I mean, 0-3 there, just, just brutal here. So we're going to see... Space Station Gaming move into that positive column. Aw, oh, crap, Lapakati, Samuel Basoto, and the God RF all together once again. Chivas Esports falling to 0 and 3. Still time to turn things around. Not a lot, but, you know, they've shown some promise once again. Kevin RA finding a difficult time getting a good spot here in their lineup. I, I, I think King of the Hill is probably the place you put him in for at least a little bit. Yeah, I mean, they want to get him, get him into the mix, but... It's, it's how do you get that player into the mix? You know, we don't know what's going on in their training room at the moment. What we do know is they have to feel like they are right there. Yeah. They are so close. So the big question is going to be what happens next weekend. Let me take a look at who their matchup is for our next weekend. In week four, Chivas Esports 
is going to be pulling double duty Dig and Misfits. Hmm. So that's going to be kind of a, a big swing one. If Chivas can come out of next weekend 2-0, and they are right back in this. If they lose even one of those two, those are two middle to lower of the pack matchups, that might be the end of their season. Yeah, it really does feel that way because I just can't imagine what the morale is like in that team room going into the rest of those matches after going 0-2 next weekend. So fingers crossed for Chivas Esports. We definitely want to see them succeed, at least to some extent. And speaking of teams that succeed, Team Liquid, our former world champions coming up to face off against Dignitas. Team Liquid definitely been up and down. And I'll tell you right now, we saw their lineups going into 2v2 and a little bit of a change coming your way. So we'll obviously talk about that when we come back from our break. Not super surprised about that one. We'll see if they can get in rhythm today against Dignitas, who has already been kind of a spoiler so far. Can they get in proper form and move into the winner's column one more time? We'll be back in just a few more minutes with our final match of the day on our Saturday for week three.
Welcome back to our third and final match of the day. Some shots there of Berlin, Germany. We will, of course, be seeing our German team tomorrow in SK Gaming. Well, half German, but a German organization overall. They'll be in their big 3-0 versus 3-0 matchup against Tribe tomorrow. But right now, we have the defending world champions, Team Liquid, facing off against a team that is maybe overperforming, outperforming their expectations in Dignitas. Yeah, Dignitas playing really, really well. Both of these squads coming off wins last week. Bale was the standout for Dig, picking up four game wins, two in 1v1 over Pedro and two in King of the Hill over Belican and Michifu, respectively. That's huge. That's absolutely huge, considering that Dignitas has played two matches, and they picked up five King of the Hill wins in those two matches between Codigo and Bale. Team Liquid also coming off a win, a little bit less surprising because Igor was do excuse me, was dominant as always, and it was over Chivas, who we've seen struggle a lot so far. So maybe a little bit of a different story coming into this match. Yeah, this will be a curious one. I think that the big story for this one is what is Liquid doing in 2v2 because Dignitas has yet to win a game in the opening set. <laughs> they just do not have their act together in 2v2 whatsoever. And if Team Liquid can't win this one, that ends up being a real question mark to their off-season moves, picking up Razor, who's a phenomenal player, but this feels like a must-win 2v2 for Team Liquid. Well, the great position that Team Liquid and Eric Benamou have kind of put themselves in to succeed is the fact that they only need one guy to play 1v1. That's it. They don't need anyone else. They don't need Surgical or Canario or Razor to do it. It's just Igor now. So what does that mean? Any of those other three can be a great 2v2 duo, and they all have experience under their belt in that set, and positive experience to, to, to top it. So, yeah, I, I'm very curious. I think we'll see. You mentioned we're going to see a change in this one. We'll see what that is in just a few minutes. For now, let's go ahead and jump into a little preview of Team Liquid against Dignitas. Oh, y terrible clásico. Ahí tenemos un clásico de clásicos. Liquid contra Tintas. Los dos van 1-1. Uno uno. Una victoria te pone muy bien. La otra, una derrota realmente te complica. Partida, 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 partida. Ahí ve el cierra esto. Punto. Punto. Para Dignitas. Dignitas contra Team Liquid. Team Liquid ahí no está en un buen momento. Dignitas ganó la última partida. Entonces, esta va a ser difícil. Va a dar Team Liquid. Ainda não acabou, Brunão. Já tem o próximo cemitério chegando. Já vem o Bebê Dragão tancando também. Acredito que agora foi fatal para o Pompeio. O Bebê Dragão levou. So for Dignitas and Liquid, it's going to be all about that transitive theory. If Cream can beat Liquid and Dig can beat Cream, then Dig should be able to beat Liquid. Right? And Fireball, no elixir for it. GG, well played. So a scary one for Team Liquid for sure. Which takes a walk back. Baby Dragon splash damage, and that's gonna be it. Bale clutches up. Dignitas takes the upset win in their second match of the season. Wow, I mean, great performances from Dignitas. Liquid and Dignitas both even at one and one coming into the weekend. One of these two squads will leave the weekend with a positive win rate. The other one will fall into the lower half overall of our standings. On the front end, Andrew Dignitas, you were talking about it. Bale coming through last weekend in a big way. Yeah, Bale, Flash, Codigo, and Lindsay coming out for Dig. So far, Bale and Codigo have been the standouts in regards to head-to-head -to -head play because they have struggled so much in that 2v2. But also for Dig, they took down Cream, who took down Liquid. Could that translate over for them as we take a look at our red roster for the day? The other side of it, Team Liquid, which... A lot of familiar faces in the blue in Surgical Goblin, Igor, and Canario, adding probably the biggest off-season signing between the spring and the fall split of Razor, hoping to round out and shore up their 2v2. Hasn't been the case yet. Might be a bit of a difference today. And, you know, talking about these stars, Andrew, there on the far right, the most famous player in the game, Surgical Goblin, who is currently nominated in the voting for the Esports Awards for Mobile Player of the Year. And uh, good luck to him. Those votings are open until November 8th. Yeah, go give our boy Surgical Goblin some love. Flash and Cody go coming out for Dignitas with a ban on Tornado. Surgical Goblin back in the 2v2 with Razor now. I like this more for some reason. I don't know why. I have nothing to base it off of, but for some reason it just feels a little bit more correct to me. 
Well, let's go ahead and jump on into this one. Team Liquid's Razor Surgical Goblin top of your screen, Flash and Cody go at the bottom. And if you do watch any of Surgical Goblin's videos on YouTube, you are very familiar with the view that you're seeing right now. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, you are. So Razor here, skeleton. I was just going to say, Razor, a lot of smiles in the first couple weeks. A um, lot more serious look today, knowing what is on the line for Team Liquid. Yeah, I mean, this is an important one. Again, this is the the original, the sort of more classic 2v2 duo for Dignitas, Flash, and Cody Go. The experiment they had in week number one, I'm really not sure about it. The Lince Bale experiment yeah. that they went with didn't really pay off. And of course, the week two change didn't work as well. So big questions here for Dig, because their head-to-head -head play has been phenomenal. If they can get this 2v2 going, which has not been the case historically for this squad, it could be an upside for Dignitas, the chance to make playoffs. Yeah, and I think obviously what we saw from Bale maybe gave them the freedom or the comfort to pull this move off. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, this is the duo that we were expecting to see in week one, right? But then they sell Absolutely. out on those other two for two weeks, but at the same time, they don't really ever actually commit to them because it's only one match per. It feels like this is what should have happened weeks ago. Yeah, but you understand why they went with the change, right? Cody Go career in 2v2 is at 38%. Flash is at 42%. So they thought, hey, let's try something different with Bale and Lince. It didn't work. And so far, we don't really know what's worked in 2v2. So far, in this game, no one's really put an advantage out. Yeah, a couple hits there coming in from Dignitas with that E-Wiz and Fisherman. But Team Liquid right back on the offensive. <clears throat> you can see... A couple words being spoken there by Razor in the bottom right hand side of your screen. Rage Up Balloon does get death damage. Fisherman low here. Gonna pull the nope, does not put the Royal Giant onto the bomb tower, so that's gonna be a ton of damage for Dignitas. Yeah, yeah, that is not an interaction that you wanna misplay, especially when it comes to the Royal Giant being that close to your tower, missing the bomb tower, and you see a bit of a scratch at the head and a sigh of, I wouldn't call it relief, maybe stress from Razor. Yeah, this is, they, they have not found the rhythm, and you know, it's interesting. Razor was having a, a, a better rhythm overall in Misfits with Dip, with George. Yeah. In last season, so far, just has not seemed to be able to get on the same page as his teammates at Liquid. So Dignitas, Cody Go, and Flash going to probably pick up this very first game as that Royal Giant is just going to town on Team Liquid's King Tower. This is huge. This is a very, very big thing for Dignitas. It's kind of funny because you and I had expected to see this in week number one, but they finally busted out in week three. And here we go. They get their very first game win in the opening set. And you see Flash is really pumped up there on the top left-hand side of the screen to finally get that 2v2 game win. And just Liquid could not get it together. And you see the fireball coming out very, very late in this one, and they never really used it early on to take care of those Skeleton Dragons. Yeah, so Team Liquid's still trying to find their third game win, and, you know, this pull that we're looking at on the replay was, I don't want to call it the nail in the coffin, but this is definitely where they started digging the hole. You know, there was no way for them to defend that the way that they wanted to after that push. After that Royal Giant did that much damage, their opponents are never going to change lanes. They're never going to do anything different. They're just going to pile on at the river and hope to get one shot until they know you're doing exactly this. You can't defend it. You can't stop it. So what do you do? You switch lanes and try to steal a tower. No way, no how, says Flash and Cody Go. And look at how much Elixir was spent on the right-hand side trying to switch lanes, trying to do anything. Yeah. But Bomb Tower, Musketeer, Snowball, or Bomb Tower, Musketeer, Fireball, that's it. Takes care of it easily. And uh, pretty rough going there for Liquid in game number one. <sighs> yeah. Team Liquid's struggling a lot in the 2v2, and they have great head-to-head -head play on their entire roster. Every single one of them could come out in a 1v1 set, and I wouldn't be surprised to see it. But not taking 2v2 at all for Team Liquid, they can only ride how much talent they have on the back end of their roster for so long. When they run into those other squads like SK and Tribe that are going to beat them in 2v2, you don't want to go into those last two sets down one. You don't want to go into 1v1 against Javi or Jupiter King. You want to pick up a 2v2 set win, and they just can't do it right now. Yeah, and, and you know, this kind of gets us to the, the question of their 2v2 overall. Certainly, they had trouble with 2v2 last season in the spring split. 
it was a really short season. Mm-hmm. It was a really short split. Coming into that, they had not really had any significant trouble in 2v2 in the past. And a big part of this was releasing Diego B, who's moved to Chivas now where he's having success in the 2v2 set. There is something to be said for having a duo that's played a ton of matches together, bringing in someone brand new at this stage. They don't get to play or practice in the same room together. They're split up across across an ocean separating Razor and Surgical Goblin or Canario. You gotta wonder, Razor's a great player, but from a chemistry standpoint, was replacing Diego B with Razor the right move for their 2v2? Yeah, that becomes a very, very difficult question for the Team Liquid staff to ask themselves. Razor, great, great player, but maybe, just maybe, they go back to Surge and Canario in 2v2 and let Razor keep the name the King Killer that he earned for a reason. Yeah, it's it's an interesting possibility. And, you know, you look at this, Diego B over at Chivas where he's not getting, where they're not getting match wins. Team Liquid still struggling in 2v2. And Misfits, with the struggles they're having, you wonder how different the landscape looks if Razor stays with Misfits, they pick up either Schwarzen or Bob to round out that 2v2 duo and shore it up a little bit. And then you have uh, Team Liquid with Diego still in the mix. Be very curious to see what that universe looks like. Yeah, a very fascinating what if, because honestly, at this point, it feels like none of the changes paid off. Still early, but very fascinating to look at. I mean, yeah, Team Liquid is 1-1 one one in the season. It is still in the third match of nine in this regular season, so a little early to, to start breaking glass in case of emergency, but there's there certainly is synchronization and, uh, and chemistry problems so far in the 2v2 pairings for Liquid. So here we go. Graveyard coming in for Liquid. Dying Skeleton crossing there, but Loverjack going to do good, easy work on that. So going double graveyard this time. Giant Skeleton cleans up the remainder of that and a raged up counter push coming in for Dignitas. So now Freeze out of cycle can't be used in timing with their graveyard and also showing their opponents what to look out for. That's one thing we've seen a lot with these Freeze decks, Andrew, whether it be this double graveyard freeze or the graveyard balloon freeze is it seems like more and more this season in particular, we've seen Freezes forced out on defense, and that was a lot of damage with Freeze not available in round two. Yeah, that was a moment they really, really could have used that Freeze defensively. And uh, here we go, just putting on the pressure. Fisherman to meet Fisherman, gonna work. Giant Skeleton. Bomb tower low. Oh man, this is all bad for Team Liquid. This is real, real rough for Team Liquid right now. Cannoncar is trying to get across the bridge, and it might get a connection here. Noah, Heal Spirit Lumberjack drop keeps the, the Skeleton Dragon alive as well, so now pressure the opposite direction. It just feels like a lack of communication or just a misstep here from Surgical and Razor in regards to... The, oh man, here we go. I'm just going to stop talking for a second and see what happens. Yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see if they get anything out of it. Double graveyard yeah. freeze drop. That feels like, I mean, look, they are still ahead on Elixir, so maybe it wasn't a total desperation play, but it definitely did feel a little bit like they were trying to force it. Yeah, and now we're seeing the plays that we need to see from them a little bit earlier, spending more attention to defense, looking for those fishermen with those high skeletons. These are the types of plays that you have to make when playing against great 2v2 squads. Graveyard in, but no Elixir to support it this time, so... As we go into the final minute 15, it is still Dignitas in a pretty good position. We'll see if they get, if they can get one more hit here, they can go in and start doing some spells on that tower. The question is, can they get it? That early cycled fisherman gonna ruin things here for Team Liquid. Royal Giants still locked on tower. Freeze comes in, fireball in, and one HP remaining. Where's the log? Graveyard trying to steal it, not gonna happen. Log comes in, G. G, well played, and that's going to be it. Team Liquid falling 0-2 to a pumped up Dignitas in the opening set. And I love to see that emotion from Cody Go and Flash. Finally putting things together in this 1v1 set is huge for them. Now takes the pressure off of King of the Hill, where they've actually been playing exceptionally well. So what are you gonna do in King of the Hill? Definitely gonna see Cody Go and Bale in there. Maybe even Flash after a good performance. And now the rookie, or yeah, now the rookie will be in that 1v1 set. So this is what 
Dignitas wants to do, and what a great way to do it against a struggling Team Liquid. Yeah, I mean, absolute struggle for Team Liquid. There's no question about it. Now, two and six on the season in 2v2 is Razor. 0 oh and three in sets. And again, this is what he was brought in for, and they just cannot seem to figure it out. I, I don't I don't know what to do. I don't know what, what the option is for Liquid. And you see here, this fireball on top of that bomb tower happened over and over again. And the Fishermen's from Team Liquid just not getting great value, whether it was because of late units being dropped to distract or if it was because of their opponent early cycling their own fishermen. So really, really nice plays here from Kodigo and Flash. And I'm just wondering if we start to see Canario and Surgical Goblin in this opening set moving forward. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the rhythm is. I mean, that double graveyard drop, I'd love to go back and look at that again. Maybe I'll do that uh, after the match is over today. That double graveyard drop was interesting. Usually when you do double graveyard, you're cycling. You're going yeah. graveyard. Get out all the, Get all the defensive troops out. Graveyard again. The double drop there just felt, again, like a desperation move on the part of Team Liquid. A bit surprised to see that play made, and obviously it didn't pay off. Yeah, it's it's not going to. There's no way for that to actually pay off unless your opponent just has zero elixir and they're making wrong decisions. Double graveyard, and I think they even dropped a freeze in there. It's just too much spent and not enough out of it. And they know it's a sellout. They know that's the only way to win the game, but... I don't know. I think they also know that it's not going to work. You know what I mean? There's times when you're like, I just if I can get this fireball on that tower, then I should win, even though you know it's not enough damage to actually take the tower down, but you still force it. That felt exactly like that situation. I'm going to pitch the, slight, the slightest and weirdest buff possible to freeze right now. I feel like freeze should freeze spells. Because if that freeze had caught the log, maybe, partway on that of the tower, huh. what kind of interesting, compelling thing, right? Freeze the log in place, freeze the fireball in place. It wouldn't be ma it wouldn't matter often, but when it would, it could be very compelling. That would be hilarious to see a fireball freeze battle going back and forth between two guys that had no direct tower damage, and they just kept catching them in the middle over and over. We'll see. I mean, I'll be honest. A couple years ago, you talked about the arrows rework, and it got pretty close to what you were talking about, so... I don't know, man. I'm watching out. I'm watching out. All right, let's get back to this. King of the Hill, Cody Go, Lince, and Bale coming out. Canario, Igor, and Razor in response. No Surgical Goblin in the King of the Hill set, even though last week we saw a great win and clutch from Surgical Goblin taking out Pompeo to extend their life to the third set. So interesting decision-making here from Trainer Luis. I mean, excuse me, from Eric I like, Benamu. I like seeing Razor in here and... You know, it's become maybe a meme at this point. I don't mean to like to pour salt in the wound, but Surgical Goblin did post a Fortnite highlight on for, on YouTube yesterday. So, you know, you ought to wonder, he's been focusing a lot on 2v2. Can he prep both 2v2 and King of the Hill and put a Fortnite highlight together all during the same week? Maybe uh, Eric Benamu deciding that just 2v2 is enough to focus on at this stage. Mobile player of the year, maybe, but still human. So looking like Lava Night Witch for Canario. And Cody Go still could be a plethora of options. Yeah, curious to see how this is going to match up, what responses he's going to have for the skies. First minute away, no damage yet. Royal Giant down and Flying Machine in response. Yeah, Fireball going to make easy cleanup of that. Skeleton Dragon in a very opportune position for Cody Go because what it's going to do here is take this Night Witch out of play. Oh, does no, not. No, it and does now not. Minor Night Witch push, and those arrows are not going to do much for Cody Go on the right hand side. Canario going to get a ton of damage. Heal Spirit not going to be played, I don't believe, available at that moment, and wow, huge counter blow from Canari. Yeah, no, not at all. Heal Spirit used to heal up those Skeleton Dragons in a missed call by me. I thought that one Skeleton Dragon was going to stay out of range or at least get enough damage on those bats. Not the case, and we all know how it feels when a minor Night Witch crosses the river and you have very, very little elixir to respond. So Canario going to save the tower here, but give a lot of damage up in order to really push this right-hand lane. 
Miner will probably come in towards that Musketeer, but there's going to be some protection in front of him. Yeah, so there you go. Miner right on top of the Musketeer. I think Cody goes doing the correct thing by not selling out too much more arrows. Great use of arrows there. And now an option for him to go back on offense, but I think he needs to go to the left-hand lane. 1321 on the right-hand side. Skeleton Dragons come out high to protect the Flying Machine. And that will be an inexpensive defense for Cody Go on the right. Yeah, inexpensive defense for Cody Go does allow one shot to come in from the Skeleton Dragon. Not great, but, you know, still 440 available. Miner goes to the right-hand side and one tile off. We'll still get a bunch of shots here. Trying to stay away from that Fisherman is why he played it so low, but the Fisherman still does catch the eye and go back to pull it off. Here we go into sudden death overtime. It is Canario with the lead but Cody Go battling back in the left-hand lane. Yeah, Cody Go didn't get a need to get back on offense as soon as possible. Miner in, great catch there with the Fisherman. How long can Cody Go stay alive? Doesn't quite prevent the mm -hmm. damage though, about a half tile away, so that's fireball range on the right-hand side. Cody Go trying hit desperately to get enough damage on the left. Not gonna happen, that's gonna be a GG well played Canario with a big win in game number one. Yeah, just a couple of ill-timed decisions by Cody Go give Canario that match. That's a big game win for Canario, just because it's been a slow start for him this season, not being in that 2v2 set where he saw so much success in the prior seasons, you know, in the fall and spring, respectively. The spring, as you just mentioned, was not great for them, but just getting him back out and play more is gonna be a really, really great thing for him in general because he is so strong in this specific set. Yeah, I mean, Canario is one of the all-time greats in King of the Hill, four King of the Hill sweeps, lifetime win rate now at 60% in this set, 31 and 21 in his career. Yeah, so Canario out, moving his head-to-head -to, -head to 65%, it looks like, here as well. And that Royal Giant coming in for Cody Go early on, great damage. Looks like he's in a pretty good position. This Skeleton Dragon, just a little slow on the draw and a little too far away from where Cody Go wants it to be. Arrows come out early, not enough damage on the Night Witch. Bats come in, and that is all bad news. Yeah, those arrows really didn't do much for Cody Go, so... Canario takes a huge lead, and then as we get into sudden death overtime, this miner, you know, it looked like it was going to be a catch. It really did, but a half tile off from Cody Go on the pickup, and he might have had a pretty good shot at being able to put pressure on the left-hand side and steal the win here, but just enough damage gets in to get that in fireball range right-hand side. Canario sneaks on through and takes game number one, King of the Hill. Yeah, Canaro getting his first game win that actually has heavy weight on the match. His other game wins have come in that 2v2 set that he lost with Razor against Cream and Chivas, but picking up his first head-to-head -head win this season is gonna be great. He fell to Diego B, his old teammate, little, maybe a little bit of a rivalry starting, but this is the Canario that we expect. And for their opponents in Dignitas, this is tough because if Canario is playing really well and you've got these other two guys, you know, Razor is the king killer for a reason and Igor who's basically been unstoppable or, you know, maybe the Ruben for Team Liquid, this is trouble for Dig. Canario with that win going to 31, now has sole possession of the most wins career-wise in CRL West wow. amongst active players. Next up, Wings right behind him at 30. And what was his number? 31. 31, got it. Yeah, Wings didn't play King of the Hill last week in their final match, so given the opening there, Canario steps right on through. That top three being Canario, Wings, and Javi in total King of the Hill wins. Lince, you talk about people who've do, done well in King of the Hill. Lince is actually fifth overall on that list in career King of the Hill wins at 26, so five behind his opponent, Canario. Two of the top five players in King of the Hill going head-to-head -head right now. Wow, definitely definitely someone you would sleep on with that strong of a record here in this set. Just someone that kind of snuck by with such a great performance. Well, Lince had some pretty big King of the Hill showings of course, in 2019, but put up two sweeps back in Sierra Latin America oh. playing for Sandstorm. Yeah, and right now, Lince in a lot of trouble early on. Down, I mean, pretty much even on Elixir, if you will, but down about 1,200 HP. 
and you see the big out breath and the, the flopping lips there from Lindsay not happy <laughs> with the way that one went. Yeah, that, it's, it's, it's a lot to come back from at this point going up against Canario. Looks like Lindsay's going to be running Graveyard. You see Canario here has got a decent amount of responses with the Night Witch E-Wiz and, of course, that Heal Spirit with Log. Fisherman does go to tower and get one shot, so adding even more frustration. Another bit, you see the eyebrow raise from Lince. Kind of can't believe the situation he's in right now. The other thing that he's probably kind of racking his brain to figure out is how he's going to get a tank across the river when his opponent's running giant and will just retarget your DPS onto your side of the map. And happy to just go ahead and throw that miner into the safe spot is Canario. I mean, doesn't even need to worry about it. At this stage, who cares about a King Tower activation? And this is what I'm talking about. Pretty nice timing with that giant there as he knows the knight's going to come down the lane and the knight, baby dragon, and the ice wizard are all going to be distracted. And a miner one more time into the safe spot here. Knight does turn around and pick it up. 582 on the left-hand side. And this was not an insignificant chunk of damage dealt by Lince as we get into the final 10 seconds of regular. Yeah, nice push there by Lince, needing to get a little bit more DPS down on these river battles. Maybe that's where he needs to start using his poison, but then he wants to use it, I mean, excuse me, where he start, needs to start using his fireball, but he's got to save that elixir to defend the skeletons. Giant getting slowed way down, just trying oh. its best, does not get a shot off, and so now a three-quarter health knight supported by a mostly healthy ice wizard behind, graveyard in, Baby Dragon, though, not quite tanking. Yeah, Miner to the back. Baby Dragon not tanking. King Tower activation going to help a little bit, but not exactly what Lince needs to ensure victory. Yeah, at this, at this point, that King Tower activation was less about the King Tower and more about getting the Miner off that tower. Exactly. So this is going to be a big, big exchange. He should be able to defend against this giant pretty well. The question is, what does Lince do about this next Miner? Yeah, I mean, and I a think... And a pre-NATO, very... Very nice from Linsen. Yeah, really, really nice, but the spell cycles battle is already in. Log, Fireball. Linsen does as best he can to kind of stay alive and preserve the health of his squad, but Canario knew that it was already in the bag at that point. Yeah, the prenado, if the cycle had been just a half step different, maybe, just maybe, it could have been as impactful as the call I gave it, but at that point with the Fireball all the way back around, not going to do enough. And Canario adds another win to his record, 32 total in his career in King of the Hill. So sweep city so far, two up, two down for Dignitas in that 2v2 set. And now Canario coming out for Team Liquid doing one of the things that, honestly, we would say he does best. But after spending a couple seasons in that 2v2, we just know he's an incredibly well-rounded player. So... Here we see Lince going on the offense, and we talked a little bit about how the Baby Dragon is not tanking for the graveyard, and we were pointing out that King Tower activation coming in late, and as you said on broadcast, Rich, it's more about pulling that miner off the tower to prevent damage than it is about finally activating the King Tower, because we're not really worried about that King Tower adding much additional DPS. Um, but yeah, you know, just tough, really tough start for Lince. I think I was wondering if I said something wrong on broadcast because you just like burst it out in laughter, but then I saw what you were talking about with Lince's frustration with that opening 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 <laughs> that was, and you know, I could, I, I, we don't have, we don't have mics on them, but I swear I could hear it. That's how frustrated <laughs> he was in that moment. Look, he, he does a better job of showcasing his frustration than I do when I lose things like that, when I make misplays like that. So Lince goes down, Bale now up for Dignitas. This is a big moment for Bale. He did it last weekend. Can he do it again today? I don't know because he's got a tall, tall order in front of him. Yeah, Canario, Igor, and Razor for a King of the Hill sweep. And against a team that has King of the Hill sweeps in them. Yeah. We're talking about those sweeps overall. Canario, part of the four sweep club, along with Wings, Razor, TNT, and, uh, and TNT. The only player with more than those guys is Javi Catorze with five. So Canario with a chance here to join Rarified Air as the only two players with five King of the Hill sweeps in the CRL West. I wonder how many times in a day we can talk about stats or things that should be true, and then we have to punctuate it with Except Javi Catorce, because he just apparently <laughs> defies the logic and the numbers that we've put together. 
Yeah, I mean, he and Javi's one of those players, and Canario is very similar. Who they neither one of those players are known as ladder players. Maybe Canario more yeah. than Javi. Uh, but you talk about two players who really have made more of their bones from being top tier in the competitive scene. Now, on top of your screen, Bale at the bottom here. Last chance for Dignitas to close this out in two sets is Bale going one, two, three on Canario, Igor, and Razor. Can he do it? Yeah, and you know you you don't you don't love the chances there, and then of course you lose this set and you have to go up against. 99.9% .9 chance it's going to be Igor in the in, in the 1v1 set. So Bale here with maybe no significant pressure at the moment, but, you know, I think the pressure will feel... If he wins game number one, I think each game he wins, the pressure will feel more and more because right now no one will fault him for losing this one. Yeah, that, that's actually a really, really good point that you make too because the other part of that becomes beating Igor in three matches out of four coming up and it can't be in the yeah. he can't lose in the first one you know <clears throat> yeah that's a huge one that's a huge one indeed so graveyard in for bale or for canario and oh. bale with a really cheap and interesting counter push yeah and just a slight misplay by canario there, not getting his barbara where it needed to be and an excellent heal spirit behind for bale to get a lot of good damage in on that left hand tower and an overspend by canario to get even more in on the right wow absolute wow just like that bale is way in the lead and in the lead in the first of three that he has to win to try to close this thing out for Dig as we go into double elixir time, final minute of regulation. In this, what appears to be a graveyard v. graveyard match, it is Bale currently in control. Yeah, Bale in control doesn't have his poison in cycle, so that's why you'll see here Canario going to kind of sell out on this push, put a lot more elixir down on the floor, take that musketeer off the board. Ice Wiz low to slow things down. Musketeer will easily take care of the Ice Wizard. And Bale needing to back and, off here because he has lost the bridge battle. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, 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 we just saw a lot of what this bridge battle is about. It's about Bale wanting to get the Ice Wiz out of the game and Canario wanting to get that Musketeer out of the game. Exactly. Exactly. That's going to be where this match is won and lost. Poison early out of Diggs, Young Star. And this Musketeer protected mm -hmm. by the Baby Dragon, big moment for Bale. Yeah, and so you see Canario going, all right, I lost that battle, now I need to defend adequately. Poison on defense, high bomb tower, should be able to reset here. This is so fascinating, dude, this is incredible. Yeah, and Bale's gonna be back to a Musketeer here in just a moment. He's going to wait for a little bit for this setup. There we go. And now he's going to stop the baby dragon high and let the musketeer work low. No, decides. Oh, there we go. There comes the goblin cage. Yeah, goblin cage up high. Musketeer working on that baby dragon as well instead of being focused on the skeleton. The skeletons get some damage in, but a large counter push coming in for the Dignitas rep. And that's a good heal spirit for Bale. Gives a little oh, extra, and that's going to be it. That's man. the one I believe. Wow. Just barely holding on is Canario, and he has a chance for a good counter push here, and a nice NATO. Can he capitalize here with the Musketeer going the wrong direction? That is a massive tornado. Goblin Brawler still too beefy to stop. However, that is going to put another bridge battle in Canario's favor. Graveyard in, the poison high for Bale. Another NATO to pull the Musketeer Ooh. away. Doesn't quite do it. She will not help against the Graveyard, but now Canario has to spend on the left-hand side. Cannot let that Musketeer go all the way to tower. She does connect. That's going to be three shots from the Musketeer. Trouble Four in shots. both lanes for Canario. Ooh. Ho, 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 ho. Man, you saw how that match changed so quickly, and it was all about winning or losing a bridge battle and how you decided to reset. And that was so fascinating for all of you graveyard players out there. I would I would advise you to go back and watch that five more times just to see the exact interactions you're supposed to make. Huge, huge win for Bale. Has to get two more if he wants this win to really matter here at this stage, but still a nice one and that's a key victory for bale partially also just for his own uh for his own feeling and emotion in this moment and that puts him at three and oh 
overall in, on the season in King of the Hill. Yeah, I mean, 3-0 and in King of the Hill, 5-1 and in head-to-head -head play, and just great numbers for this young star. Can we say that yet? Is he going to be a young star? Because right now, he's taking down Belican, Michifu, Pedro, and Canario. That's pretty dang good. Yeah, that's that's very, very important. Uh, pretty pretty nice work, and this is, again, what they hoped he would get out of him in the spring season, and he just needed some time. It was a short spring season. It seemed like Bale just needed some time to get comfortable playing in CRL, and right now he is, and you see Canario going for some fancy moves. Mm -hmm. Tried it again here, but didn't quite pull the Musketeer, and you got to wonder if that really would have affected things at all. Yeah, you know, will it, won't it? We loved the first one. Second one didn't work out. I think Bale knew that it was... Uh, probably going to come in knowing that it wasn't the end of the world if it did, because the one thing that he does by playing that musketeer there, and it ended up working out even better for him because it was still focused on the right-hand side, is he knows he'll probably bait out three more elixir from his opponent, which in turn cannot be spent on that graveyard. So really, really well played by both these guys. You know, Canario came out and did exactly what you'd hope him to do, struggling in 2v2, coming out in King of the Hill, picking up two big-time Ws, and that puts, like you said, a lot of pressure on Bale that I think it's exponentially worse as this goes forward, each W makes it more and more stressful. This one gets interesting because I think that if Bale beats Igor, there's more pressure on Razor with an elimination game as opposed to Bale with a game to give. So the, I think this next one is the most important one. If Bale beats Igor, I give him the advantage over Razor just because of the pressure in that moment. If he doesn't, of course, we go right to that 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 best of three to that 1v1 final set and see who comes out for Liquid. Yeah, and as we hop into this game, I'm going to kind of just expound on that thing that you're talking about with pressure for Razor and Bale. And the other thing that I think really comes into play here is, look, Razor is a series or a seasoned vet. We talk about him. We love him. We've gave him a nickname. He's got tons of sweeps out there. He's still the rookie to Team Liquid, and he's been struggling so far. So Razor, as you're saying, is going to feel a lot of pressure for numerous reasons. The elimination on the match, but also to prove that he landed in the right spot. Barb Hut down for Igor. And Bale going to respond with the Musketeer just to keep those Barbs from doing damage on the right-hand side of the... A little leakage there just to give the right timing for those skeletons to protect. And if you want to talk about Igor and what he's done so far this season, two and two in King of the Hill, losing to Belican and Pompeo, taking down Diego B and Adrian, but two and oh in 1v1. And this is the the big defense that Bale's gonna have for the for the graveyard is that skeleton dragon set, but notice the patience from Igor playing the poison after the heal spirit had already been used, meaning that heal spirit skeleton dragon combination totally ineffective for Ben. Yeah, really, really small thing to point out, but as you can see, a massive difference in outcome. First 90 seconds away, and it is the Russian with a significant now even bigger advantage, 1488 on the bottom right hand for the Spaniard. Yeah, down 1,000 HP already against this deck is something you really, really do not want to be, deal with. I mean, you know, double and triple, as we talked about, other Barb Hut decks, is just, it becomes impossible to manage. And this is just a, a difficult situation for Bale overall, of course, needing to get a bunch of wins in a row. But against a Barb Hut Musketeer deck with Royal Giant, it's going to be very, very difficult for the Dig player to break through to the next level. Yeah, yeah, and it almost feels like we're already on to our 1v1 set at this point, just looking at the matchup here, but we've seen crazier things happen. Will Igor make a misplay, or will Bale do something spectacular to steal this game, steal this match? Well, about an elixir and a half, elixir and a quarter advantage right now for Igor and sets up Barb Hut one more time. RG goes away from the Barbs. So Bale trying to create some pressure in the opposite direction. And again, it looked like an off heal spirit there. Heal spirit should have maybe hit the dragons with the help of the delivery to take them off the board, but it's not happening for Igor. Pressure from Igor on the right hand side and forces out the fireball. Here we go into sudden death overtime. Igor still in control. We've seen Bale try to go for the move into the opposite lane. It didn't work. Now pushing right back into the Barb Hut. Yeah, easy decision there for Igor to put that Barb Hut back down on the board when the fireball comes out. And 
Here you see four beefy units crossing the river and a graveyard in turn. And there was the correct timing you were talking about, Andrew, the Royal Delivery Heal Spirit taking care of the skeletons in that one. And now damage starting to pile up on the right-hand side, 718 remaining with a little over 90 seconds left. Kale going back on the offensive, seeing if he can make anything happen. Barb's in response. Yeah, just Barb Hut Musketeer gives you so much ability to slow down and then completely ruin that royal giant. Very, very difficult for Bale. Yeah, and then you talk about the four barbarian counter push that comes in for free. It ends up not really being a positive trade for Bale. Just all bad news for this matchup. And delivery doing its job for Igor here as well. You don't see as much delivery as you used to, but Igor using it well in this case. And going graveyard in the right-hand side. We'll see if he can get significant damage here. Does have to play defense with a healthy Barpa and Musketeer. This should be a pretty easy situation for Igor to handle. And yeah, that's going to be a GG well played. Yeah, and you know exactly what Bale was going for. Let me see if I can somehow take this on the left-hand side because there's no way I can defend the right adequately. Doesn't actually end up doing either of those things. And here we go into that 1v1 set with what will most likely be a matchup, repeat matchup of what we just saw. Yeah, I'm very curious. The only reason why I'd see they would go differently is if maybe they feel like either they like the Linsane matchup against Igor better or they feel like maybe Bale has shown his hand a bit too much with those two decks that we already saw. So most likely Bale, I think you're right there, but I wouldn't be shocked if they decide to go with Lince in set number three. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be shocked. I think the only reason that I also really lean towards Bale is just because I don't think that Dignitas wants to lean on Lince as their 1v1 guy. And I think that they want to do that with Bale. So does it really actually suit them to put Lince out there, even if Bale may have burnt through a couple decks? In the long run, I don't think that's where they actually want to end up. And so getting him ready and kind of grooming him for that may not be beneficial. Beneficial. However, like you said, if he just straight matches up better against Igor due to what we have down for either of their histories, we could still see it. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's a question. Like, it's, it's hard to really fault Bale on that one. No, yeah. no way to break mm -hmm. through and get any significant tower damage with that Royal Giant deck against the, the Barb Hut Musketeer Graveyard out of Igor. And that's also even scarier to look at, by the way, talking about Igor. Is Igor is known as a fast cycle player, known, of course, as a mortar player, but you see him going in something that's not really what you think of as an Igor kind of deck and playing it perfectly and playing it with a good matchup, like getting the right matchup. That just shows the versatility, and you already have the skill of Igor. You add versatility into it as well, and he gets more and more frightened. Well, and the other thing that just adds to that frightening aspect of Igor is that if he ever plays Mortar, you don't have a good matchup. Even if you're running Earthquake, seven Earthquakes and direct tower damage somehow, you still don't have a great matchup against him. So he's got that ace up his sleeve always that you always have to be looking out for. Then you talk about what you and I have become accustomed to seeing him do, which is higher cycle, higher outplay ability. And now he starts throwing in seven elixir cards and slowing things down with graveyard. He's just so well-rounded, it becomes impossible to strategize against him. Yeah, you plan to try to beat him at his own game. And look, Igor's known for almost forcing mortar, right? Igor going, yeah, I'm going to play mortar, deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so you try to try to game plan around that. And just that little wrinkle, what I love about that in the King of the Hill, going with that deck in this situation, was knowing that it he didn't need to win that game. He could win that game, didn't need to. Went with a safe deck, but one that also maybe throws off the analyst a little bit and sets up this BO3 for game for, for our final set. And if you talk about matchup, that would have been a much better matchup for Bale to be in if more if Igor had been running that. So, you know, a lot of good decisions being made by Team Liquid, who did struggle to start off today, but since then has been playing very, very well in King of the Hill, which is no surprise to anyone out there. Most likely going to be what we were talking about. 100% Igor, I can't imagine it won't be. And then on the other side of it, I think it's Bale. He's been playing so well these days. And I think putting him up against Igor this early on is kind of like, all right, let's, let's see what the kids got out there. You know, you know what I mean?
Yeah, might as well. You might as well. And again, like you can't take away, you can't judge the game that we just saw in terms of how Bale and Igor go against each other because right. that matchup was so rough for Bale. So I think you're right in that one. And right now, uh, Dignitas, their coach, Drexen, calling the timeout, want to really go over. And I think this timeout might be because of the deck they saw from Igor. Because they were like, wait, what? Now you're doing Barb Hut Graveyard? Okay, we have to rethink our entire panel of decks we have planned for this matchup. Yeah, where where do we go now? Where do we start? If you start with Q, what's next in the alphabet? You know, how do we decide to game plan against that? So, Igor, will we see Mortar? Will we see High Cycle? Will we see something heavy once again? Will we see Golem Clone? We've seen it once today already from St. Bellic, and really the meta is starting to open up a bit in head-to-head -head play because it's such a big guessing game. I felt like in the first couple days, or even in the first maybe several matches we got in this season, we saw a lot of the same things over and over. It does feel now, here at the end of day one and week three, it's starting to spread just a little. Not a lot, but just a very little bit. You know, if I'm Team Liquid and I and Igor wants to run Mortar, I say do it in Game 1. Mm -hmm. Igor running Mortar in Game 2, I feel like no matter what happens, especially if Dig wins Game 1, actually no matter, no matter what happens, I think Dig runs a counter to Mortar in Game 2. So if I'm Team Liquid, I run Mortar in Game 1 if you want to run it, and then I run a counter to the counter in Game number 2. Yeah, because we've definitely seen Igor go back to Mortar even if he loses in game one or if he wins. So I love the call on the anti-Mortar in game two. Let's see what Bale brings out against the Mortar God himself, Igor, in this ever important 1v1 set. Of course, neither of these players have a ton of reps overall in the 1v1 set. Igor is three and three in set victories in his career in the 1v1. Bale one uh, is going to be one and two in that same period. And look at that. Who'd have thunk it? Who would have? Well, you and me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the right call. It's 100% it the right call here. You know, you, you don't have to go mortar, but if you're going to go mortar, go with it in game number one. Don't mess around. Get it done there. Because now it becomes this, I bet the, the analyst is just like, oh, man, now what? Now what am I going to deal with in game two? Is it just going to be mortar again? Because we know Igor loves to do that. It just becomes a very stressful situation to put your opponent in, and that's what happens when you're that good with one win condition. So Sparky to the left, Goblin Giant to the right. We'll see how he controls the mortar high oh, with the cannon wow. cart. Wow. Really nice cannon cart. Beautiful. Beautiful cannon cart. Look at that. Controls the goblin giant a little bit longer. Will get a stab on the right hand side and a little bit of extra damage here, but could have been a whole lot worse. Yeah, so even though that was incredibly well managed by Igor, you see that he's actually taken more damage here. And the deck that he's running is going to fare pretty well against Goblin Giant Sparky because he has two tanks and he technically has two buildings. And then on top of that, he's got the great skeletons when used perfectly can counter that Sparky. So it's not that Igor doesn't have a lot of options, it's just that Bale has a really, really great way to put pressure on both lanes that's very heavy hitting and you see the graveyard come in high and we've seen Igor run this deck a couple times already this mortar graveyard deck does take care of the Sparky this time and Goblin Giant up right now is Bale in the back into the same lane You have to imagine that Dig has been prepared for this deck out of Igor. And a good fireball there for Bale. Yeah, nice fireball and more damage in on that left-hand side. And I'm going to soak up the Sparky Shot. Is that Knight? <clears throat> the Sparky is just Love. a menace right now for Igor. Absolutely. Absolutely, although now we'll have some good ways to control it here, and now Mortar's up into the left-hand lane. Does Igor. Yeah, Igor going to fireball that. Yep, there it is. Kill Spirit, though, played very, very nicely by Bale to prevent one more shot. Oh! And no Mortar to pull, so Igor's going to go ahead and just pressure the left-hand lane, because Mortar not in cycle, 
to pull on that Goblin Giant. Yeah, and I don't know if that's going to be the wave. I mean, you do see here he got lucky enough that that Musketeer had a little bit of HP left. Mega Minion on the tower. That's going to do it. Huge, huge game one win for Bale. That is massive. What a performance. And Igor, you know, you, you, you understand what he was going for there with the cannon cart to pressure in the opposite lane, but low on elixir, low on defensive capability, and a rough one there for the Russian. Yeah, I'm wondering if Igor maybe got a little too fancy or, or maybe just got a little too predictable. As he said, he's run that deck a good amount of time so far this season. He hasn't played a ton of games, so maybe he just goes for something more traditional in the sense of classic mortar bait or the most popular mortar iteration with the skeleton barrel. There's just not enough on the ground for him to deal with both sides of that. The Sparky was such trouble, whereas, you know, we talk about the Skeleton surrounding the Sparky and getting a great positive trade out of that, but with the other decks we're talking about, the Skeleton Barrel popping, the Goblin Gang surround, the Spear Goblin surround, there's all these other great options to help with that Sparky that Igor didn't have at his disposal here. Yeah, you see the Mortar pressure there on the left-hand lane, and the moment that Bale sees that, he goes, Oh, you have no way to stop this Goblin Giant from going directly to your tower. It's completely impossible. And the Cannon Cart tries to put pressure on, but both times you see really inexpensive defense out of Bale on the left-hand side, complete domination on the right, and now Dignitas with a chance to beat Team Liquid here in their third match of the season. Yeah, and, and the other part of that was the Skeletons, right? The Skeletons for defense for Igor, when you're going up against a Giant, Great. Going up against a golem? Great. Going up against a goblin giant? Not so much, because it puts you in the spot where you have to let that goblin giant spear goblins lock on either your princess tower or your DPS dealer and the musketeer, and then you gotta deal with it. So really difficult, and also takes those very high DPS units, very cheap units, completely out of play. So Bale now moving his head-to-head -head win rate on the season to five and two, 71% so far. On this one, no, actually, no, moving to six and two. My apologies there. So even better than I thought. A nice 75% win rate on the season at this stage. Very, very nicely done. And a chance here to get a signature win over Igor. This is huge. Bale taking this 1v1 over Igor after what we saw Dignitas do in the 2v2, this is a turnaround match for this team. Even if their record is only 2 and 1, what they show they can do with these four gentlemen is going to be massively larger than what we thought they could obtain last weekend. Let's go ahead and jump on into it. Bale with the advantage right now. And Igor opens up with. There you go. Some cycle that you expect out of the Russian. Yeah, and I'm really curious to see what Bale does here, knowing that, well, okay, all right, Igor going to go cycle, but then a heavy bar putt, and I'll just stop talking because he kind of just negated what I was going to say with going really light on the front end and heavy on the back. Well, you know, it's interesting, even though the bar putt is so expensive, still able to get around fairly quickly with... 1-1 one, one and 2 Elixir and the Heal Spirit Skeleton and Log, respectively. Yeah, so really, really efficient defenses is what Igor is going to be looking for here. And it's going to be Royal Hogs for Bane. Yeah, and this Mega Knight's going to cruise on through, take out those Skeleton Dragons and the Musket... Uh, I don't know about that Fireball. Well, you wanted some of that off the board, but... I I think instead he probably should have just went Royal Hogs in the opposite lane just to see what he could have got out of his opponent. Interesting. And here you go, Bar Putt in response to the Royal Hogs. If that Fireball would have hit the Musketeer and the Princess Tower or the Skeleton Dragons and the Musketeer, I think it would have been a better decision. But it didn't hit the Musketeer Princess Tower and only hit the Skeleton Dragons. Just not a good yeah. use. Yeah. That's a rough one, and that's part of that decision-making... You know, it's interesting, you know, you, you talk about fat fingering one or sometimes it's just making a decision in a split second and one tile difference with a spell like that can mean even trade versus a lot of value. Yeah. Heal Spirit to the left-hand lane for Igor. 
This is a match point here for Bale, but down by about a thousand. Not in the position he would like to be in. So pigs on both sides, Fireball and Mega Knight for Bale. And Bale plays the Mega Knight to protect the Musketeer and then plays the Fireball. Igor has to play some defense here, but both of the pig counters are now out of cycle for the Spaniard. Yeah, so here we go. Musketeer going to get distracted by the Heal Spirit. Musketeer of Igor going to be coming down with maybe split hogs here or all out. No, doesn't do anything. Well, he had to spend, a, he had to focus on defense there and maybe just trying to set up for the next cycle around. Yeah, that, that's definitely the healthy correct Barba. decision. Yeah, as I say, he has a healthy Barpa on the board now that really has not been affected much at all. Mega Knight comes down, but still again, this time, look at, again, we're, we're talking about how the cycle plays not for this attack, but for the next attack, and a completely healthy Barpa and tons of Elixir right now for Igor. So Fireball coming in for Igor. You see his decision making. You see it's different there. What does he do? One Skeleton Dragon and the Musketeer. That's the kind of decision making you have to make at this level. And you see now Igor's up by about four and a half, maybe five Elixir with the Musketeer on the board and had a bit of an advantage there as well. He's gonna get, doesn't quite get on, but you see now Bale's having to make last second defensive decisions. Yeah, and now his Musketeer is out of cycle for the position he wants to be in it. He either has to double down and defend it or let it die on the vine. So he has to let it die because he knows too much Elixir would be spent. And now we go stacking barb huts is Igor on the left-hand side. Mega Knight forced to cycle in the back to play defense this time. Yeah, and with that, Mega Knight coming down the left-hand side and the Barb Hut in the back left. It feels like great fireball that should bring out Royal Hogs. And no, Igor's just wow. playing it real, real slow yeah. here. Very, very smart plays. He knows he has the advantage right now and how hard it's going to be for Bale to break through. Mm -hmm. So just sitting back, playing some defense, and knowing that if he can just not give up a ton of damage for 30 seconds, he's got this one. And you know what? It, it was that first Barb Hut played in the back. That was the beginning of the end for Bale because it's exactly what you're kind of breaking down here for the people at home. It's just Igor recognizes this massive, massive lead he has and goes, the only way I lose this is by not defending, over defending for the next minute and a half. One Mega Knight down, second Mega Knight trying to help here. Bale doing anything he can to get on the left-hand side. Not going to be enough. Igor ties things up. We are one and one and once Ooh. again going to a third and final game to decide it all. All right, you and I have toyed with pressure all day long and kind of speculated who has got the brunt of it. Does it now go directly and wholeheartedly back to Bale or is Igor at all stressed out in this situation? Igor wouldn't feel pressure if you put him in the crusher of a garbage truck. <laughs> this dude is so stone cold. I mean, it's it's absolutely insane how calm he is at all times. So I am not concerned at all about the pressure on Igor's side. Every little bit of it right now is on Ben. What, it's, I love that you say that because one of my favorite things is when you go back and you watch the most famous match in history of CRL, it's that one HP match between Surgical Goblin and Morton. And I'm pretty sure that is the most expressive I have ever seen and will ever see Igor in, in probably our entire relationship of knowing each other. Yeah, I mean, what did he raise an eyebrow? Yeah, it was like a half have a smile. smile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, Igor, there, there's there's no such thing as pressure. Put him 10,000 leagues under the sea, and he's still swimming around clean, clean and clear. So, And you know what? These, I think he'll be fine. These here. replays are actually a perfect example of what we're talking about. The fireball decisions that he's made in these last five like seconds. You see there, fireballing at the river, fireballing up high on top of the skeleton dragon and the musketeer, not worrying about more damage on the tower, just all the right decisions being made by this Russian. So here we go. Match three. I don't know what he actually comes out with, what Igor comes out with. It doesn't feel like he goes back to Mortar, but then again, having success with Mortar so much in his past and being the best guy out there with it, maybe he does it and thinks that they won't put him on that. My, This is the hard thing about game planning for Bale right now. I think Bale goes heavy, mm -hmm. right? I don't think Bale goes something with a lot of high cycle here. I wouldn't be surprised to see Bale either go Lava Hound or go back to Sparky. 
Neither one of those two things would surprise would, would shock me tremendously here. I think he goes with the deck where he think where, where he, I think he plays the matchup game more than the outplay game against Igor. Yeah, and in Lava Hound Minor with Barbs feels like something that could be faring pretty well against Igor, just because you know the most popular meta decks for Mortar right now don't have a ton of air damage, and a lot of decks in general don't have a ton. It's usually just kind of the Musketeer. So maybe that's what Bale goes for in hopes that he can maybe outplay the defenses dropped by Igor, but that's obviously way easier said than done. Yeah, no, it's going to be really curious. I mean, the the if we're talking about mentality, right? Going back to the conversation about Igor and mentality, the only knock on Igor's mentality might be the occasion where he feels himself too much, mm. right? It might be the situation where Igor goes and says, yeah, you know I'm playing Mortar, I'm playing it. Or where he plays the same deck four times in a row against Jupiter King in the No-Tilt World Championship, right? right? If there's, But nerves are not one of those things. So if Igor just, um, if Igor sits down, if he's on the, on the call right now with, uh, with, with his team and makes a good deck choice here and doesn't try to be flashy, just tries to play good Clash Royale, I think really it's just about whether or not he gets a horrific matchup or one where he can outplay on whether or not Igor gets the win here. Yeah, it, it, you know, that conversation that we have so regularly in King of the Hill about matchup advantage now becomes really the name of the game here in this final 1v1 because it is just a King of the Hill matchup now. It is just a King of the Hill. What are you going to come out with? I'm going to try to fool you. You're going to try to surprise me. Winner take all. And, you know, we've speculated a lot. Let's find out what they two are going to do. Let's jump on into it. Best of one to decide the fate of these two squads. And Bale going Skeleton Barrel. The question is, is it Mortar Skeleton Barrel or is it uh, like a Mega Knight Minor Skelly Barrel? Igor with the Royal Delivery. Hmm. So Bale looking like he might be pulling a fast one here on Igor and going with the Mortar Barrel deck. And Split Hogs for Igor. And Bale doesn't have a, a great response for that split at this stage, putting more pressure on. And what a nice delivery there to clean up the skeletons and pick up the mortar. Yeah, very, very nice delivery. Going to see something played in the center here by Igor? No, he's going to let that mortar lock on. Well, might be setting up for his counter push here. Let's see if he puts something in front of the musketeer. Chooses not to. Yeah, I mean, he's going to force Bale to respond down an elixir and he knows that Bale can really put pressure up for very, very cheap here. So approaching the midway point of regulation time and so far it's been all Bale with the real significant pressure. Fireball forced out on defense against those skeletons and it just seems like Igor mixture of not having the tools he'd love and maybe his cycle's not in the right place in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, you saw how he had to defend against that Musketeer with the high heal spirit and then the skeletons. Uh, really, really smart decision making by him, but just as he said, maybe not the way his cycle, he's, the cycle's not where he'd like it to be. And that was a great, great call on that mortar defense. Went with the pigs in the opposite lane. Mortar's not going to touch those bad boys at the bridge. Mm. And then Musketeer to clean up the mortar. So just like that, Igor takes control of the lead and has dual lane pressure. So this barrel not going to make it to the tower and not going to get any damage in with the skeletons. And it feels like maybe Igor has fixed those cycle issues that we saw earlier on. Barb hut down. And oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, oh boy. Yeah, that, oh th boy. that's exactly what it was, Rich. He fixed that cycle and it was a big time defense with that heal spirit and skeletons because what happened was Bale pre-logged the heal spirit. He knew that was the only response was the heal spirit or skeletons. Igor set them off to the left and he got that elixir advantage, which is why we are where we are now. And a nice delivery pops the skeleton barrel high, takes care of the goblins behind. And right now, it's feeling like momentum starting to swing towards Igor Musketeer in the pocket to clean up some of that. Yeah, Fireball from... That's a good log. Yeah, really good log. Fireball from Igor doesn't go where he needs it to, so that's why he's kind of in a tough spot now. But doing a good job distracting is that heal spirit, and now the Barb Hut takes the brunt of it. A lot of pressure coming in right now from Bale. Mortar should get no, does not get on tower. Musketeer gets down just in time, but 
Igor kind of hanging on right now, trying to avoid any significant damage. Mortar does not get that last shot off on the tower. Yeah, the timing for Igor on defending that Mortar was perfect. It was brilliant, but the problem is, is he's now hurting for Elixir, and this deck really, really piles it on quickly, especially when the Musketeer is still on the board. One Spear Goblin does get through on the right-hand side. A knight to protect the Mortar. And now again, the same Pig's Push on the left. Fireball in response. No Heal Spear at this time, oh. and Delivery has to come out. So how is Igor going to defend he against the Skeleton Barrel? Bale with great pressure. I don't think he is, man. Mortar gets to the tower now. Musketeer in, Skeleton Barrel wow. on the tower. That is it! Wow. What a huge win for Bale. A huge win for Dignitas. And the pressure from the Spaniard ends up beating out the pressure of the moment. Wow, and you can see how hyped he is, and how could you not be? You take down Igor playing a Mortar, you take down Team Liquid with three massive wins coming in as the last guy in King of the Hill for your squad. Being this young to the league, this is everything that Dignitas could hope for. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely huge. Dig now moves to two and one on the season, and they have they have one guy to thank for it. Really, it's it's Bale. Bale has carried hard now uh, in a couple of situations, but don't forget the two v two of this squad as well overall. And this was the pressure trying to come in from Igor, but the ability to create quick damage on with this deck from Bale really really oppressive yeah and this musketeer as you can see is on the board for so long she's still hanging out somehow takes out igor's musketeer and that right there is brutal to, to any semblance of success that you want if you get your musketeer eaten alive there's almost no coming back from it and you add in that later on that barb hut comes down is just a strictly seven elixir defense unit those are both huge trades that you can't really come back from and the other thing is is with the deck that bale is playing the moment you have a little elixir advantage you can turn up the heat so easily big win for dig and now the questions do begin to arise for Team Liquid. They have not had success in that 2v2 set at all. It's been an absolute nightmare for them. And you sit there and you go, okay, well, we still have the ability to carry in the head-to-head -head play. Not a guarantee with how tight this league is this season. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We said the, the, the opening video of the season is, is us talking about how much the competition has changed. You know, when you and I sat down with the production team about that, the competition is through the roof this year. And you'll see it from a guy like Bale taking down a team like Team Liquid. I think it's time to hit reset. I think it is. I think Surgical Goblin and Canary need to come out in that 2v2 set. I think Razor needs to go into the King of the Hill and continue to do what they've been doing. We saw how good Canario and Surge can be. They need to get back to that form. Let Razor chill out, find his comfort in his new home in Team Liquid and get some King of the Hill wins. And then let Igor do what he does. I, I wouldn't put this as a slight or a knock on Igor that they lost today. But the front end for Team Liquid has to get better. Yeah, and you know, it's one of those hard things where Team Liquid is one of the teams not in a team house. They have four players in four separate countries. Heck, they're on, on, on three separate continents between yeah. Razor and North America. <laughs> we have the Europeans and then uh, way up on, on the high part of Asia and Russia is Igor. So you have no ability for the 2v2 to be in the same room, which of course we're not, that's not the same issue that they're having with Dig, with Dig having a, a split up 2v2 situation, but they just cannot create that chemistry from scratch the way that other teams have with being able to be in the same room. So now Team Liquid has lost to Cream and they've lost to Dignitas early on in our former world champions are really struggling to get this new superstar roster working together. We've seen it a lot in other sports that just because you have big names all on the same squad, it doesn't actually mean you're going to get the gold at the end of the season. So a reset from Team Liquid. I believe they're going to be done for the weekend. So they're going to come back out in week four needing to get a victory. It has to happen and it has to happen early on in that next match. It has to see we have to see good success in that 2v2 and King of the Hill. Well, Team Liquid still has Tribe and Space Station. And I believe that's the next two weeks coming up is Tribe and Space Station. And then SK on top of it. So they still have kind of the heart of the order, so to speak, coming through in their schedule as the season goes on. So it's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder as they go closer and closer towards playoffs. Yeah, so let's take a look here at our standings. Two squads facing off tomorrow at 3 
and oh, and also our number one and number two teams in Tribe Gaming and SK. We'll see who comes out on top and who stays perfect through three weeks. Following that, Team Queso on the, I guess Ruben kind of carrying him on their shoulders, but some great plays from the rest of his squad. SSG, bit of struggles today, but able to come out on top with a two and one record. Dignitas to round out our top five at two and one with a big time win over Team Liquid. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the middle of the pack there for Cream, uh, Liquid, Space Station, Queso, and Dig, all very, very tight. And, you know, next weekend it is going to be Liquid versus Team Queso, so that's a huge one for both squads. Then rounding out at the bottom, Payne, who we'll see tomorrow, along with Misfits at 0-3, and, and then Chivas Esports taking, you know, we've talked in the past about sort of the unlucky nature of energy in former seasons it seems like chivas now maybe has inherited that curse yeah yeah absolutely and that's definitely not a curse that you want on your roster tomorrow's matches pain gaming looking to find their first win on record because of that penalty facing off against cream real betis pulling their second match sk gaming and tribe middle of the day barn burner you don't want to miss that one and to close things out misfits against space station also looking for their very first win Make sure you're subscribed here on YouTube and on Twitch. Those notifications turned on so you do not miss a second of the action tomorrow. You will definitely be bummed if you miss any of those matches. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be decided there. You have two teams that desperately need a win to say relevant. It's going to be top six. You don't have to even be in the top five or the top four to make playoffs. But an 0-4, 0-3, like that just starting off that deep into the season where you kind of have to, at, you have to not just win out, not necessarily win out, but win a lot to make it into that number six spot to squeak into that spot. And then that middle matchup, SK Gaming and Tribe Gaming. I don't want to call predictions yet, Andrew, but it did look like maybe Tribe had some cracks in the armor with their 2v2 against Space Station last week. I agree. I definitely agree. And what we've seen out of SK is success through a lot of adversity, a lot so far early on this season, and they've still come out on top at three and oh, and that speaks volumes for the, again, the strength of that roster and those four guys and of Coach KV. So once again, break time battles. Guys, go check them out. They should be, uh, you can go sign up for them today, but the battles will take place between Wednesday and Wednesday, so you can get some battles in this week, but you'll be a little bit behind. StatsRoyale.com, break time battles for your chance to be featured here on the CRL broadcast to play against a pro. Number one gets a pro, no, top five gets some swag, top 50 get to see their names right here on broadcast. And of course, go and follow us on Twitter. Let us know who your match MVP is of the day today at Esports Royale EN. Rich, do you have a match MVP? Is it just going to be Bale again for both of us? I mean, Bale, I think, is a really excellent call, but I'm going to go with Ruben. I think yeah. Ruben's my MVP. You know, Team Queso lost the 2v2 early on. They didn't have that cushion to play with. Ruben was huge in King of the Hill, great in the 1v1, and, and played brilliantly. It wasn't just that he won, it was that he won in style. Perfect understanding of the matchups, perfect micro, it was perfect Ruben, and that's why Team Queso is in the advantage this season. Yeah, Ruben, the God RF, and Michifu, I believe, are our crown leaders for the day with some really, really nice performances from those three gentlemen. Fantasy Royale, remember, 250,000 gold, 100 gems, top four crown leaders every single week. You can pick up and drop those players throughout the week. They just got to be set by our match start on Saturday morning every single week. Oh, what a day, man. I, I got to go get some rest or something because tomorrow's going to be even crazier. Yeah, I mean, again, we get to crown. Someone will be 4-0 and tomorrow. I'm very excited about that one. And of course, getting that king of the hill for SK versus Tribe is going to be <laughs> brilliant. I wonder if we'll see any performances like we saw today because today was huge for king of the hill, Andrew. Absolutely, guys. We'll be back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you in a bit.